Section 29 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16 by Various. Selected Poems by Edmund Goss, 1849 to blank. Edmund William Goss, or Edmund Goss, to give him the name he has of late years adopted, is a Londoner, the son of P. H. Goss, an English zoologist of repute. His education did not embrace the collegiate training, but he was brought up amid cultured surroundings, read largely, and when but 18, was appointed an assistant librarian in the British Museum, at the age of 26, receiving the position of translator to the Board of Trade. Goss is a good example of the cultivated man of letters, who fitted himself thoroughly for his profession, though lacking the formal scholastic drill of the university. He began as a very young man to write for the leading English periodicals, contributing papers and occasional poems to the Saturday Review, Academy, and Cornhill Magazine, and soon gaining critical recognition. In 1872 and 1874, he traveled in Scandinavia and Holland, making literary studies which bore fruit in one of his best critical works. He made his literary bow, 121, with the volume, Madrigal's Songs and Sonnets, 1870, which was well received, winning praise from Tennyson. His essential qualities as a verse writer appear in it. Elegance and care of workmanship, close study of nature, felicity in phrasing, and a marked tendency to draw on literary culture for subject and reference. Other works of poetry, on Viol and Flute, 1873. New Poems, 1879. For Dowsey in Exile, 1885. In Russet and Gold, 1894. With the dramas King Eric, 1876, and The Unknown Lover, 1878, showing an increasingly firm technique and a broadening of outlook, with some loss of the happy singing quality which characterized the first volume. Goss, as a poet, may be described as a lyrist with attractive descriptive powers. Together with his fellow poets Lang and Dobson, he revived in English verse the old French metrical forms, such as the roundel, triolet, and ballade, and he has been very receptive to the new in literary form and thought, while keeping a firm grip on the classic models. As an essayist, Goss is one of the most accomplished and agreeable of modern English writers. He has comprehensive culture and Catholic sympathy, and commands a picturesque style, graceful and rich without being florid. His studies in the literature of Northern Europe, 1879, introduced Ibsen and other little-known foreign writers to British readers. Goss has been a thorough student of English literature, prior to the 19th century, and has made a specialty of the literary history of the 18th century, his series of books in this field including 17th Century Studies, 1883, From Shakespeare to Pope, 1885, The Literature of the 18th Century, 1889, The Jacobean Poets, 1894, to which may be added the volume of contemporaneous studies, Critical Kit Kats, 1896. Some of these books are based on the lectures delivered by Goss as Clark Lecturer at Trinity College, Cambridge. He has also written biographies of Sir Walter Raleigh and Congreve, and His Life of Thomas Gray, 1882, and Works of Thomas Gray, 1884, comprise the best edition and setting forth of that poet. In such labors as that of the editing of Heinemann's International Library, his influence has been salutary in the popularization of the best literature of the world. 
His interest in Ibsen led him to translate, in collaboration with William Archer, the dramatic critic of London, the Norwegian's play The Master Builder. Edmund Goss, as editor, translator, critic, and poet, has done varied and excellent work, sensitive to many literatures and to good literature everywhere. He has remained staunchly English in spirit and has combined scholarship with popular qualities of presentation. He has thus contributed not a little to the furtherance of literature in England. The poems are all taken from On Violin Flute, published by Henry Holt and Company, New York. February in Rome. When Roman fields are red with cyclamen, and in the palace gardens you may find, under great leaves and sheltering bryony bind, clusters of cream white violets. Oh, then the ruined city of immortal men must smile, a little to her fate resigned. And through her corridors the slow warm wind gush harmonies beyond a mortal ken. Such soft, favonian airs upon the flute, such shadowy censers burning live perfume, shall lead the mystic city to her tomb. Nor flowerless springs, nor autumns without fruit, nor summer mornings when the winds are mute, trouble her soul till Rome be no more Rome. Desideratium. Sit there forever, dear, and lean in marble as in fleeting flesh, above the tall gray reeds that screen the river when the breeze is fresh. Forever let the morning light stream down that forehead bright and white, and round that cheek for my delight. Already that flushed moment grows so dark, so distant, through the ranks of scented reed the river flows, still murmuring to its willowy banks. But we can never hope to share again that rapture fond and rare, unless you turn immortal there. There is no other way to hold these webs of mingled joy and pain. Like gossamer, their threads enfold the journeying heart without a strain. Then break and pass in cloud or dew, and while the ecstatic soul goes through, are withered in the parching blue. Hold, time, a little while thy glass, and youth, Pulled up those peacock wings. More rapture fills the years that pass Than any hope the future brings. Some for tomorrow rashly pray, And some desire to hold today. But I am sick for yesterday. Since yesterday the hills were blue That shall be grey for evermore, And the fierce sunset was shot through With colour never seen before. Tyrannic love smiled yesterday, and lost the terrors of his sway, but is a god again today. Ah, who will give us back the past? Ah, woe, that youth should love to be like this swift Thames that speeds so fast, and is so fain to find the sea that leaves this maze of shadow and sleep, these creeks down which blown blossoms creep for breakers of the homeless deep. Then sit forever, dear, in stone, as when you turned with half a smile, and I will haunt this islet lone, and with a dream my tears beguile, and in my reverie forget that stars and suns were made to set, that love grows cold, or eyes are wet. Lying in the grass, between two golden tufts of summer grass, I see the world through hot air as through glass, and by my face sweet lights and colors pass. Before me, dark against the fading sky, I watch three mowers mowing as I lie. With brawny arms they sweep and harmonize. Brown English faces by the sun burnt red, rich glowing color on bare throat and head. My heart would leap to watch them were I dead. And in my strong young living as I lie, I seem to move with them in harmony. A fourth is mowing, and the fourth am I. The music of the scythes that glide and leap, the young men whistling as their great arms sweep, and all the perfume and sweet scents of sleep. The weary butterflies that droop their wings, the dreamy nightingale that hardly sings, 
and on the lassitude of happy things, is mingling with the warm and pulsing blood that gushes through my veins a languid flood and feeds my spirit as the sap a bud. Behind the mowers on the amber air, a dark green beech wood rises still and fair, a white path winding up it like a stair. And see that girl with pitcher on her head and clean white apron on her gown of red. Her even song of love is but half said. She waits the youngest mower. Now he goes. Her cheeks are redder than a wild lush rose. They climb up where the deepest shadows close. But though they pass and vanish, I am there. I watch his rough hands meet beneath her hair. Their broken speech sounds sweet to me like prayer. Ah, now the rosy children come to play and romp and struggle with the new-mown hay. Their clear, high voices sound from far away. They know so little why the world is sad. They dig themselves warm graves and yet are glad. Their muffled screams and laughter make me mad. I long to go and play among them there, unseen like wind to take them by the hair and gently make their rosy cheeks more fair. The happy children full of frank surprise and sudden whims and innocent ecstasize. What godhead sparkles from their liquid eyes. No wonder round those urns of mingled clays that Tuscan potters fashioned in old days and colored like the torrid earth ablaze. We find the little gods in love's portrayed through ancient forests wandering undismayed and fluting hymns of pleasure unafraid. They knew, as I do now, what keen delight a strong man feels to watch the tender flight of little children playing in his sight. I do not hunger for a well-stored mind. I only wish to live my life and find my heart in unison with all mankind. My life is like the single dewy star that trembles on the horizon's primrose bar a microcosm where all things living are. And if among the noiseless grasses, death should come behind and take away my breath, I should not rise as one who sorroweth. For I should pass, but all the world would be full of desire and young delight and glee. And why should men be sad through loss of me? The light is flying and the silver blue the young moon shines from her bright window through. The mowers are all gone, and I go too. End of section 29section 30 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in June 2022. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16. Section 30. Heinrich Heine by Rudolf von Gottschall, born 1823. Rudolf von Gottschall was born in Breslau, September 30, 1823. He was the son of a Prussian artillery officer, and as a lad gave early evidence of extraordinary talent. His father was transferred to the Rhine, and young Gottschall was sent successively to the gymnasiums of Mainz and Koblenz. Even in his school days, and before he entered the university, he had through his cleverness attained a certain degree of eminence. His career at the University of Königsberg, whither he went to pursue the study of jurisprudence, was interrupted by the results attendant upon a youthful ebullition of the spirit of freedom. His sympathy with the revolutionary element was too boldly expressed, and when in 1842 he published Lieder der Gegenwart, Songs of the Present, he found it necessary to leave the university in order to avert impending consequences. In the following year he published Zensurflüchtlinge, Fugitives from the Censor, a poem of a kind not in the least likely to conciliate the authorities. He remained for a time with Count Reichenbach in Silesia and then went to Berlin, 
where he was allowed to complete his studies. He was, however, refused the privilege to become a university docent, although he had regularly taken his degree of Dr. Jures. He now devoted himself wholly to poetry and general literature. For a while he held the position of stage manager in the theatre of Königsberg, and, during this period, produced the dramas Der Blinde von Alcala, The Blind Man of Alcala, 1846, and Lord Byron in Italian, Lord Byron in Italy, 1848. After leaving Königsberg, he frequently changed his residence, living in Hamburg and Breslau, and later in Posen, where in 1852 he was editor of a newspaper. In 1853 he went to Italy, and after his return he settled in Leipzig. Here he definitely established himself, and undertook the editing of Blätter für literarische Unterhaltung, Leaves for Literary Amusement, and also of the monthly periodical Unsere Zeit, Our Time. He wrote profusely and exerted an appreciable influence upon contemporary literature. He was ennobled by the emperor in 1877. As a poet and man of letters, Gottschalk possesses unusual gifts and is a writer of most extraordinary activity. His fecundity is astonishing, and the amount of his published work fills many volumes. His versatility is no less remarkable than his productiveness. Dramatist and critic, novelist and poet, in all his various fields he is never mediocre. Chief among his dramatic works are the tragedies Katharina Howard, King Karl XII, Bernhard of Weimar, Amy Robsart, Arabella Stewart, and the excellent comedy Pitt and Fox. Of narrative poems, the best known are Die Göttin, an Hohes Lied vom Weibe, The Goddess, A Song of Praise of Woman, 1852, Carlo Zeno, 1854, and Sebastopol, 1856. He has published numerous volumes of verses which take a worthy rank in the poetry of the time. His first Gedichte, Poems, appeared in 1849, Neue Gedichte, New Poems, in 1858, Kriegslieder, War Songs, in 1870, and Janus and Kriegs- and Friedensgedichte, Poems of War and Peace, in 1873. In his novels he is no less successful, and of these may be mentioned in Banne des Schwarzen Adlers, in The Ban of the Black Eagle, 1876, Welke Blätter, Withered Leaves, 1878, and Das Goldene Kalb, The Golden Calf, 1880. It is, however, chiefly as critic that his power has been most widely exerted, and prominent among the noteworthy productions of later years stand his admirable Portraits und Studien, Portraits and Studies, 1870-71, to 71, and Die Deutsche Nationalliteratur in der ersten Hälfte des 19. Jahrhunderts, The German National Literature in the First Half of the 19th Century, 1855, continued to the present time in 1892, when the whole appeared as The German National Literature of the 19th Century. Heinrich Heine, from Portraits and Studies about no recent poet has so much been said and sung as about Heinrich Heine. The youngest writer, who for the first time tries his pen, does not neglect to sketch with uncertain outlines the portrait of this poet, and the oldest, sour-tempered professor of literature, who turns his back upon the efforts of the present with the most distinguished disapproval, lets fall on the picture a few rays of light in order to prove the degeneration of modern literature in the Mephistophelian features of this its chief. Heine's songs are everywhere at home. They are to be found upon the music rack of the piano, in the school books, in the slender libraries of minor officers and young clerks. However difficult it may be to compile an editio castigata of his poems, every age, every generation has selected from among them that which has delighted it. Citations from Heine, winged words in verse and prose, buzz through the air of the century like a swarm of insects. Splendid butterflies with gaily glistening wings, beautiful day-moths and ghostly night-moths, tormenting gnats and bees armed with evil stings. 
Heine's works are canonical books for the intellectual, who season their judgments with citations from this poet, model their conversation on his style, interpret him, expand the germ cell of his wit to a whole fabric of clever developments. Even if he is not a companion on the way through life, like great German poets and smaller Brahmins, who for every day of our house and life calendar give us an aphorism on the road, there are, nevertheless, in the lives of most modern men, moods with which Heine's verse harmonize with wondrous sympathy, moments in which the intimacy with this poet is greater than the friendship, even if this be of longer duration, with our classic poets. It is apparently idle to attempt to say anything new of so much discussed as singer of modern times, since testimony favourable and unfavourable has been drained to exhaustion by friend and foe. Who does not know Heine, or rather, who does not believe that he knows him? For, as is immediately to be added, acquaintance with this poet extends really only to a few of his songs, and to the complete picture which is delivered over ready-made from one history of literature into another. Nothing, however, is more perilous and more fatal than literary tradition. Not merely decrees and laws pass along by inheritance, like a constitutional infirmity, but literary judgments too. They form at last a subject of instruction like any other, a dead piece of furniture in the spiritual housekeeping, which, like everything that has been learned, is set as completed to one side. We know enough of this sort of fixed pictures, which at last pass along onward as the fixed ideas of a whole epoch, until a later, unprejudiced investigation dissolves this rigid grown wisdom, sets it to flowing, and forms out of a new mixture of its elements a new and more truthful portrait. It is not to be affirmed, however, that Heine's picture, as it stands fixed and finished in the literature and the opinion of the present, is mistaken and withdrawn. It is dead, like every picture. There is lacking the living, changing play of features. We have of Heine only one picture before us, of our great poets several. Goethe in his Storm and Stress in Frankfurt, Strasbourg and Wetzlar, the ardent lover of Frederick of Sesenheim, the handsome, joyous youth, is different in our minds from the stiff and formal Weimar minister, the youthful Apollo different from the Olympic Jupiter. There lies a young development between, that we feel and are curious to know. It is similar with Schiller, the poet of the robbers with its motto In Tyrannos, the fugitive from the military school, and the Jena professor, the Weimar court councillor who wrote The Homage of the Arts, are two different portraits. But Heine is to our view always the same, always the representative of humour with a laughing tear in his escutcheon, always the poetic anomaly, coquetting with his pain and scoffing it away. Young or old, well or ill, we do not know him different. And yet this poet too had a development upon which at different times different influences worked. The first epoch in this course of development may be called the youthful. The travel pictures and the lyrics contained in it form its brilliant conclusion. This is no storm and stress period in the way that, as Schiller and Goethe passed through it, completed works first issued under its clarifying influence. On the contrary, it is characteristic of Heine that we have to thank this youthful epoch for his best and most peculiarly national poems. The wantonness and the sorrows of this youth, in their piquant mixture, created these songs permeated by the breath of original talent, whose physiognomy, more than all that follow later, bears the mark of the kind and manner peculiar to Heine, and which, for a long time, exercised in our literature through a countless host of imitators, an almost epidemic effect. But these lyric pearls, which in their purity and their crystalline polish are a lasting adornment of this poet's crown, and belong to the lyric treasures of our national literature, were also gathered in his first youthful epoch, when he still dived down into the depths of life in the diving bell of Romanticism. 
Although Heinrich Heine asserted of himself that he belonged to the first men of the century, since he was born in the middle of New Year's Night, 1800, more exact investigation has nevertheless shown that truth is here sacrificed to a witticism. Heine is still a child of the 18th century, by whose most predominant thoughts his work too is influenced, and with whose European Corypheus, Voltaire, he has an undeniable relationship. He was born, as Strottmann proves, on the 13th of December 1799 in Düsseldorf. His father was a plain cloth merchant, his mother of the family von Geldern, the daughter of a physician of repute. The opinion, however, that Heine was the fruit of a Jewish-Christian marriage is erroneous. The family von Geldern belonged to the Orthodox Jewish confession. One of its early members, according to family tradition, although he was a Jew, had received the patent of nobility from one of the prince electors of Jülich Klebe Berg on account of a service accorded him. As, moreover, Schiller's and Goethe's mothers worked upon their sons an appreciable educational influence, so was this also the case with Heine's mother, who is described as a pupil of Rousseau and an adorer of Goethe's elegies and thus reached far out beyond the measure of the bourgeois conditions in which she lived. That which, however, worked upon his youthful spirit, upon his whole poetical manner, was the French sovereignty in the Rhinelands at the time of his childhood and youth. The Grand Duchy of Berg, to which Düsseldorf belonged, was ruled in the French manner, a manner which, apart from the violent conscriptions, when compared with the Roman imperial periwig style, had great advantages, and in particular granted to Jews complete equal rights with Christians, since the revolutionary principle of equality had outlived the destruction of freedom. Thus, the Jews in Düsseldorf in their greater part were French sympathizers, and Heine's father too was an ardent adherent of the new regime. This, as a matter of course, could not remain without influence upon the son, so much the less as he had French instruction at the Lyceum. A vein of the lively French blood is unmistakable in his works. It drew him later on to Paris, where he made the martyr stations of his last years. And of all recent German poets, Heinrich Heine is the best known in France, better known even than our classic poets, for the French feel this vein of related blood. From his youth springs, too, Heine's enthusiasm for the great Napoleon, which, however, he has never transmitted to the successors of the Idée Napoleonienne. The thirteen-year-old pupil of the gymnasium saw the emperor in the year 1811, and then again in May 1812, and later on in the Book Le Grand of the Travel Pictures, he strikes up the following dithyrambic, which, as is always the case with Heine where the great Caesar is concerned, tones forth pure and full, with genuine poetic swing, without those dissonances in which his inmost feelings often flow. What feelings came over me, he exclaims, when I saw him himself, with my own highly favoured eyes, him himself, Hosanna, the emperor. It was in the avenue of the court garden in Düsseldorf. As I pushed myself through the gaping people, I thought of his deeds and his battles, and my heart beat the general march, and nevertheless I thought at the same time of the police regulation that no one under a penalty of five talas should ride through the middle of the avenue, and the emperor rode quietly through the middle of the avenue, no policeman opposed him. Behind him his suit rode proudly on snorting horses, and loaded with gold and jewels, the trumpets sounded, and the people shouted with a thousand voices, Long live the Emperor! To this enthusiasm for Napoleon, Heine not long afterward gave a poetic setting in the ballad The Two Grenadiers. The Napoleonic remembrances of his youth, which retained that unfading freshness and enthusiasm that are wont to belong to all youthful remembrances, were of vital influence upon Heine's later position in literature. They formed a balance over against a romantic tendency, and hindered him from being drawn into it. Precisely in that epoch, when the beautiful patriotism of the Wars of Liberation went over into the weaker feeling of the time of the Restoration, 
and romanticism, grown over-devout, in part abandoned itself to externals, in part became a centre of reactionary efforts, Heine let this Napoleonic lightning play on the sultry heavens of literature, in the most daring opposition to the ruling disposition of the time, and a school of poetry from which he himself had proceeded, while he declared war upon its followers. However greatly he imperiled his reputation as a German patriot through these hosannas offered to the hereditary enemy, just as little was it to be construed amiss that the remembrance of historical achievements, and of those principles of the revolution which even the Napoleonic despotism must represent, were a salutary ventilation in the miasmic atmosphere of the continually decreasing circle which at that time described German literature. In the prose of Heine, which like Beranger glorified Caesar, slumbered the first germs of the political lyric, which led again out of the moonlit magic realm of romanticism into the sunny day of history. A hopeless youthful love for a charming Hamburg maiden was the muse of the Heine lyric, whose escutron has for a symbol the laughing tear. With the simplicity of Herodotus, the poet himself relates the fact, the experience, in the well-known poem with the final strophe. It is an ancient story, but still tis ever new. To whomsoe'er it happens, his heart is broken too. We comprehend from biographical facts the inner genesis of the Heine lyric. Heine was in the position of Werther, but a Werther was for the nineteenth century an anomaly. A lyric of this sort in yellow nankeen breeches would have travestied itself. The content of the range of thought, the circle of world-shaping efforts, had so expanded itself since the French Revolution that a complete dissolution into sentimental extravagance had become an impossibility. The justification of the sentiment was not to be denied, but it must not be regarded as the highest, as the life-determining element. It needed a rectification which should again rescue the freedom of the spirit. Humour alone could accomplish Münchhausen's feat, and draw itself by its own hair out of the morass. Heine expressed his feelings with genuine warmth, he formed them into drawn pictures and visions, but then he placed himself on the defensive against them. He is the modern Werther, who instead of loading his pistol with a ball, loads it with humour. Artistic harmony suffered under this triumph of spiritual freedom, but that which appeared in his imitators as voluntary quibbling came from Heine of inner necessity. The subject of his first songs is the necessary expression of a struggle between feeling and spirit, between the often visionary dream-life of a sentiment and self-consciousness, soaring free out over the world, which adjudged absorption in a single feeling as one-sided and unjustified. Later on, to be sure, these subjects of youthful inspiration became in Heine himself a satiric, humoristic manner, which, regarded as a model, worked much evil in literature. In addition to personal necessity through one's own experience, there was, for a genius such as Heine's, also a literary necessity, which lay in the development of our literature in that epoch. It was the Indian summer of Romanticism, whose cobwebs at this time flew over the stubble of our poetry. The vigorous onset of the lyricists of the Wars of Liberation had again grown lame. People revealed in the album sentiments of Tietz and Malmann, the spectres of Amadeus Hoffmann and the lovely high-born maidens of Knight Fouquet, were regarded then as the noblest creations of German fantasy. Less chosen spirits, that is to say, the entire great reading public of the German nation, which ever felt toward its immortals a certain aversion, refreshed itself with the lukewarm water of the poetry of Chlorin, from out of which, instead of the Venus Anadiomene, appear a Mimili and other maiden forms, pretty, but drawn with a stuffed-out plasticism. On the stage reigned the fate tragedies, upon whose lyre the strings were wont to break even in the first scene, and whose ghosts slipped silently over all the German boards. In a word, spirits controlled the poetry of the time more than spirit. Heine, however, was a genuine knight of the spirit, 
and even if he conjured up his lyric spectres, he demanded no serious belief in them. They were dissolved pictures of mist. And if he followed his overflowing feelings, the mawkish sentiments of romanticism occurred to him and disgusted him with the extravagant expression of his love pain, and he mocked himself, the time and the literature, dissolved the sweet accords in glaring dissonances, so that they should not be in tune with the sentimental street songs of the poets of the day. In these outer and inner reasons lie the justification and the success of the lyric poetry of Heine. It designates an act of self-consciousness of the German spirit, which courageously lifts itself up, out of idle love complainings and fantastic dream life, and at the same time mocks them both. An original talent like Heine's was needed to give to the derided sentiment such a transporting magic, to the derision itself such an attic grace, that the sphinx of his poetry, with the beautiful face and the rending claws, always produced the impression of a work of art. The signification in literary history of these songs of Heine is not to be underestimated. They indicate the dissolution of Romanticism, and with them begins the era of modern German poetry. Translated for A Library of the World's Best Literature by William H. Carpenter End of section 30「Section 31 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16, by Various. John Gower about 1325 to 1408. Since Caxton, the first printer of Confessio Amantis, the confession of a lover, described Gower as a squire born in Wales in the time of King Richard II, there has been a diversity of opinion about his birthplace, and he has been classed variously with prosperous Gowers until of late, when the county assigned to him is Kent. His birth year is placed approximately at 1325. We know nothing of his early life and education. It has been guessed that he went to Oxford and afterwards traveled in the troubled kingdom of France. Such a course might have been followed by a man of his estate. He had means for English property records, in this instance the rolls of chancery, the parchment foundation of English society, still preserved deeds of his holdings in Kent and Essex and elsewhere. His life lay along with that of Chaucer's in the time when Edward III and his son, the Black Prince, were carrying war into France, and the English Parliament were taking pay in plain speaking for what they granted in supplies, and wrestling at the same time promises of reform from the royal hand. But Gower and Chaucer were not only contemporaries, they were of like pursuit, tastes, and residence. They were friends, and when Chaucer, under Richard II, the grandson and successor of Edward, went to France upon the mission of which Foisart speaks, he named John Gower as one of his two attorneys while he should be away. Notice of Gower's marriage to Agnes Groundolf late in life, in 1397, is still preserved. Three years after this, he became blind. It was the year 1400 in which Chaucer died, and in 1408 he died. The infirm poet, says Morley, spent the evening of his life at St. Mary Overy's, St. Mary over the river, in retirement from all worldly affairs except pious and liberal support of the advancing building works in the Priory and in the church now known as St. Saviour's, Southwark, to which he bequeathed his body. His will, made not long before death, bequeathed his soul to God, his body to be buried in St. Mary Overy's. The poet bequeathed also thirteen shillings, four dinars to each of the four parish churches of Southwark for ornaments and lights, besides six shillings, eight dinars for prayers to each of their curates, it is not less characteristic that he left also forty shillings for prayers to the master of St. Thomas's Hospital, 
and still for prayers, six shillings, eight dinars to each of its priests, three shillings, four dinars to each sister in the hospital, 20 pence to each nurse of the infirm there, and to each of the infirm, 12 pence. There were similar requests to St. Thomas Elsing Spittle, a priory and hospital that stood where now stands Sion College. St. Thomas Elsing Spittle, founded in 1329 by William Elsing, was especially commended to the sympathies of the blind old poet as it consisted of a college for a warden, four priests, and two clerks who had care of 100 old, blind, and poor persons of both sexes, preference being given to blind, paralytic, and disabled priests. Like legacies were bequeathed also to Bedlam without Bishopgate and to St. Mary's Hospital, Westminster. Also, there were bequests of ten shillings to each of the leper nurses, two robes, one of white silk, the other of blue bodikin, a costly stuff with web of gold and woof of silk. Also, a new dish and chalice and a new missal were bequeathed to the perpetual service of the altar of the chapel of St. John the Baptist, in which his body was to be buried. To the prior and convent he left the great book, a martyrology, which had been composed and written for them at his expense. To his wife Agnes he left a hundred pounds, three cups, one coverlet, two salt cellars, and a dozen silver spoons, also all his beds and chests, with the furnishings of hall, pantry, and kitchen, also a chalice and robe for the altar of the chapel of their house, and she was to have for life all rents due to him from his manors of Southwell, in Nottingham, and Moulton, in Suffolk. His wife was one of his executors. The will is still preserved at Lambeth Palace. Gower's tomb and monument may also still be seen at St. Saviour's, where the description Berthollet gave of them in 1532 is, aside from the deadening of the paintings, true. Somewhat after the old fashion, he lieth right sumptuously buried, with a garland on his head, in token that he in his life days flourished freshly in literature and science. The head of his stone effigy lies upon three volumes representing Gower's three great works. The hair falls in long curls, the robe is closely buttoned to the feet, which rest upon a lion, and the neck is encircled with a collar, from which a chain held a small swan, the badge of Henry the Fourth. Beside on the wall where he lieth, continues Berthollet, there be painted three virgins with crowns on their heads, one of which is written Charity, and she holdeth this device in her hand. On toy qui fits de du le père, soit soy qui gis suces Pierre. In thee, who art son of God the Father, be he saved who lieth under this stone. The second is written Mercy, which holdeth in her hands this device. O bon Jésus, fait ta mercy, al am don le cor justici. O good Jesus, grant thy mercy to the soul whose body lies here. The third of them is written pity, which holdeth in her hand this device. Pour le petit, Jésus regard, et mes se am en sauve guard. For thy pity, Jesus see, and take this soul in thy safe guard. The monument was repaired in 1615, 1764, and 1830. The three works which pillow the head of the effigy indicate Gower's Speculum Meditantis, the looking glass of one meditating, which the poet wrote in French, the Vox Clamantis, the voice of one crying, in Latin, and the Confessio Amantis, in English. It should be remembered in noting this mixture of tongues that in Gower's early life the English had no national speech. The court, parliament, nobles, and the courts of law used French. The church held its service in Latin, while the inhabitants of Anglo-Saxon blood clung to the language of their fathers, which they had modified by additions from the Norman tongue. It was not until 1362 that parliament was opened by a speech in English. There is, says Dr. Polly, no better illustration of the singular transition to the English language than a short enumeration and description of Gower's writings. 
of the Speculatum Meditantis, a treatise in ten books on the duties of married life, no copy is known to exist. The Vox Clementis was the voice of the poet, singing in Latin elegiac of the terrible evils which led to the rise of the commons and their march to London under Wet Taylor and Jack Straw in 1381. It is doubtless a true picture of the excesses and miseries of the day. The remedy, the poet says, is in reform, right living and love of England. Simony in the prelate, avarice and drunkenness in the libidinous priests, wealth and luxury in the medicant orders, miscarrying of justice in the courts, enrichment of individuals by excess of taxes. These are the subjects of the voice crying in the wilderness. Gower's greatest work, however, is a confessio amantis. In form, it is a dialogue between a lover and his confessor, who is a priest of Venus. In substance, it is a setting forth, with moralizings which are at times touching and elevated, of 112 different stories from sources so different as the Bible, Ovid, Josephus, the Gesta Romanorum, Valerius Maximus, Statius, Boccaccio, etc. 30,000 eight-syllabled rhymed lines make up the work. There are different versions. The first was dedicated to Richard II, and the second to his successor, Henry of Lancaster. Besides these large works, a number of French ballads and also English and Latin short poems are preserved. They have real and intrinsic merit, says Todd. They are tender, pathetic, and poetical, and place our old poet Gower in a more advantageous point of view than that in which he had heretofore been usually seen. Estimates of Gower's writings are various, but even his most hostile judges admit the pertinence of the epithet with which Chaucer hails him in his dedication of Troilus and Cressida. O moral Gower, this book I direct to thee, and to the philosophical strode, to vouchsafe their need is to correct, of your benignities and zeals good. Then Skelton the laureate, in his long song upon the death of Philip Sparrow, which recalls the exquisite gem of Catullus and a like threnody, takes occasion to say, Gower's English is old, and of no value is told, his matter is worth gold, and worthy to be enrolled. And again, Gower that first garnished our English rude. Old Putterham also bears this testimony. But of them all, the English poets, particularly this is mine opinion, that Chaucer, with Gower, Lydgate, and Harding, for their antiquity, ought to have the first place. Taine dismisses him with little more than a Philip, and Lowell, while discoursing appreciatively on Chaucer, says, Gower has positively raised tediousness to the precision of science. He has made dullness an heirloom for the students of our literary history. As you slip to and fro on the frozen levels of his verse, which give no foothold to the mind, as your nervous ear awaits the inevitable recurrence of his rhyme, regularly pertinacious at the tick of an eight-day clock, and reminding you of Wordsworth's, once more the ass did lengthen out the hard, dry seesaw of his horrible bray. You learn to dread, almost to respect, the powers of this indefatigable man. He is the undertaker of the fair medieval legend, and his style has a hateful gloss, the seemingly unnatural length of a coffin. Yet hear Morley. To this day we hear among our living countrymen, as was to be heard in Gower's time and long before, the voice passing from man to man, that in spite of admixture with the thousand defects incident to human character, sustains a keynote of our literature and speaks from the soul of our history, the secret of our national success. It is the voice that expresses the persistent instinct of the English mind to find out what is unjust among us and undo it, to find out duty to be done and do it, as God's bidding. In his own English or Anglo-Saxon way, he tries to put his soul into his work. Thus, in the Vox Clementis, we have heard him asking that the soul of his book, not its form, be looked to, and speaking the truest English in such sentences as that the eye is blind and the ear deaf, 
that conveys nothing down to the heart's depth. And the heart that does not utter what it knows is as a live coal under ashes. If I know little, there may be another whom that little will help. But to the man who believes in God, no power is unattainable if he but rightly feels his work. He ever has enough whom God increases. This is the old spirit of Cadman and of Bede, in which are laid, while the earth lasts, the strong foundations of our literature. It was the strength of such a temper in him that made Gower strong. God knows, he says again, my wish is to be useful, that is the prayer that directs my labor. And while he thus touches the root of his country's philosophy, the form of his prayer, that what he has written may be what he would wish it to be, is still a thoroughly sound definition of good English writing. His prayer is that there be no word of untruth, and that each word may answer to the thing it speaks of, pleasantly and fitly, that he may flatter in it no one, and seek in it no praise above the praise of God. The part of Gower's writing here brought before the reader is the quaintly told and charming story of Petronella from Liber Primus of the Confessio. It may be evidence that all the malediction upon the poet above quoted is not deserved. The Confessio Amantis has been edited and collated with the best manuscripts by Dr. Reinhold Pauli, 1857. The Vox Clamantis was printed for the first time in 1850 under the editorship of H. O. Cox and for the Roxburgh Club. The ballads and other poems are also included in the publication of the Roxburgh Club. Other sources of information regarding Gower are illustrations of the lives and writings of Gower and Chaucer by Henry J. Todd, 1810, Henry Morley's review in English Writers, and various short articles. Petronella from the Confessio Amantis A king while loom was young and wise, the which said of his wit great prize, of deep imaginations and strange interpretations, problems and demands eke, his wisdom was to find and seek, whereof he wold in sondry wise, opposing him that were in wise. But none of him it might bear upon his word to give answer. Outtaken one, which was a knight, to him was everything so light, that also sown as he him heard the king's words he answered, what thing the king him axe wold, whereof anon the truth he told. The king some dale had an envy, and thought he would his wittest plea, to seat some conclusion, which should be confusion, unto this knight, so that the name and of wisdom, the high fame, toward himself he would win. And thus of all his wit within, the king began to study and muse, what strange matter he might use, the knight's wits to confound. And at last he hath it found, and for the knight anon he sent, that he shall tell what he meant, upon three points stood the matter, of questions as thou shalt hear. The first point of all three was this, what thing in this degree of all the world hath need lest, and yet men help it all the mest. The second is, what most is worth, and of costage is least put forth. The third is, which is of most cost, and least is worth, and goeth to lost. The king these three demands axeth, to the knight this law he taxeth that he shall gone and come in Aeon the third week, and tell him plain to every point what it amounteth, and if it be that he miscounteth to make in his answer a fail, there shall none other thing avail, the king saith, but he shall be dead, and lease his goods and his head. This knight was sorry of this thing, and wold excuse him to the king, but he no would him not forbear, and thus the knight of his answer goeth home to take advisement, but after his intendement, the more he cast his wit about, the more he stunt thereof in doubt. Though wist he well the king's heart, that he the death ne should distert, and such a sorrow to him hath take, that gladship he hath all forsake. 
He thought first upon his life, and after that upon his wife, upon his children eke also, of which he had daughters too. The youngest of them had of age fourteen year, and of visage she was right fair, and of stature like to an heavenly figure, and of manner and goodly speech, though men would all land seek, they should not have found her like. She saw her father sorrow and sigh, and wist not the cause why. So came she to him privately, and that was where he made his moan, within a garden all him won. Upon her knees she gan down fall, with humble heart, and to him call, and said, O good father dear, why make ye thus heavy cheer? And I wot nothing how it is. And well you know, father, this, what adventure that you fell, you might it satisfy to me tell. For I have oft heard you said, that ye such trust have on me laid, that to my sister, that to my brother, in all this world, that to none other, you durst tell a private so well, my father, as to me. For thee, my father, I you pray, ne casteth not that heart away, for I am she that would keep your honor. And with that, to weep her I may not be forbore, she witheth for to ben unbore. Ere that her father so mistrist to tell in her of that he wist, and ever among mercy she cried, that he ne should his counsel hide from her, that so walled him good, and was so nigh flesh and blood, so that with weeping, at last, his care upon his child he cast, and sorrowfully to that she prayed, he told his tale, and thus he said, The sorrow daughter which I make is not all only for my sake, but for the both and for you all, for such a chance as me befall that I shall, ere this third day, lose all that ever I lose may, my life and all my good thereto, therefore it is I sorrow so. What is the cause, alas, quoth she, my father, that ye shouldn't be dead and destroyed in such a wise? And he began the point's device, which as the king told him by mouth, and said her plainly that he could answer into no point of this, and she, that heareth how it is, her counsel gave, and said, Though, my father, sithen it is so, that you can see no other way, but that you must needs die, I would pray of you, O thing, let me go with you to the king, and ye shall make him understand how ye, my wits for to fond, have laid your answer upon me, and telleth him in such degree, upon my word you will abide, to life or death, whatso betide. For yet perchance I may purchase, with some good word, the king's grace, your life, and eke your good to save. For oft shall a woman have thing, which a man may not a reach. The father heard his daughter's speech, and thought there was no reason in, and saw his own life to win. He could then himself no cure, so better him thought in adventure to put his life and all his good than in the manner as it stood, his life uncertain for to lose. And thus thanked he gained to choose to do the counsel of this maid, and take the purpose which she said. The day was coming, and forth they gone, unto the court they come anon, where as the king in his judgment was set, and hath this night assent. Arrayed in her best wise, this maiden with her words wise, her father led by the hand into the place where he found the king with other which he wold. And to the king kneeling he told, as he informed was to four, and prayed the king that he therefore his daughter's words would take and saith that he will undertake upon her words for to stand, though was there a great marvel on hand, that he, which was so wise a knight, his life upon so young a wight, beset walled in jeopardy, and many it held in for folly, 
but at the last, nevertheless, the king commandeth, bend in peace, and to this maid he cast his cheer, and said he would her tale hear, and bade her speak, and she began. My liege lord, so as I can, quoth she, the points which I heard, they shall of reason be answered. The first I understand is this, what thing of all the world it is, which men most help and hath least need. My liege lord, this wall I read, the earth it is, which ever mo, with man's labor is bego, as well in winter as in May. The man's hans doth what he may, to help it forth and make it rich, and forthy men it delve and ditch, and even it with strength of plough, where it hath of him self enow, so that his need is at least, for every man, bird and beast, of flower and grass and root and rind, and everything by way of kind, shall serve, and earth it shall become, as it was out of earth numb, it shall be there thee torn again, and thus I may by reason saying, the earth is thee most needless, and most men help it nevertheless. So that, my lord, touch end of this, I have answered how that it is. The other point I understood, which most is worth, and most is good, that cost is less the man to keep. My lord, if you all take keep, I say it is humility, through which the high trinity, as for desert of pure love, unto Marie from above, of that he knew her humble intent, his own son, adown he sent, above all other, and her he choose, for that virtue which bodeth peace, so that I may by reason call, humility most worth of all, and lest it costeth to maintain in all the world as it is seen. For who that hath humblest on hand, he bringeth no wearies unto land. For he desireth for the best, to set in every man in rest. Thus with your high reverence, methinketh that this evidence as to this point is sufficient. And touchend of the remnant, which is the thread of your axinges. What lest is worth of all things, and costeth most, I tell it pride which may not in the heaven abide, for Lucifer with him that fell, bar pride with him into hell. There was pride of too great cost, when he for pride hath heaven lost, and after that in paradise, Adam for pride lost his prize in middle earth. And eke also, pride is a cause of all woe, that all the world ne may suffice to staunch your pride the reprice. Pride is the heft of all sin, which wasteth all, and may not win. Pride is of every miss the prick, pride is the worst of all wick, and costeth moth, and lest is worth, in place where he hath his forth. Thus have I said all I will say, of mine answer, and to you pray, my liege lord, of your office, that you such grace and such justice, Ordained for my father here, that after this, when men adhere, the world thereof may speak good. The king, which reason understood, and hath all heard how she hath said, was only glad, and so well paid, that all his wrath is overgo. And he began to look, though, upon this maiden in the face, in which he found so much grace, that all his prize on her he laid in audience, and thus he said, My fair maid, well thee be of thin answer, and eke of the me liketh well, and as thou wilt, forgive be thy father's guilt. And if thou were of such lineage, that thou to me were of perage, and that thy father were a pair, as he is now a bachelor, so seek her as I have a life, thou shouldest stand be my wife. But this I say, nevertheless, that I will shape, then increase. What world's good that thou wilt crave are of my gift, and thou shalt have. And she, the king with words wise, kneeling, thanketh in this wise. My liege lord, God mod you quite, 
My father here hath but a light of Warrison, and that he wends had all be loss, but now amend he may well through your noble grace. With that the king right in his place, anon forth in that fresh heat, and earldom, which than of its cheat, was laid fall into his hand, unto this night with rent and land, hath yove, and with his charter seized, and thus was all the noise appeased. This maiden, which sat on her knees to for the king's charities, commendeth and saith evermore. My liege lord, right now to four, you said, and it is of record, that if my father were a lord, and peer unto these other great, you wouldn't for naught else let that I ne should be your wife, and thus wot every worthy life, a king's word might need be hold, forty, my lord, if that ye would, so great a charity fulfill, God wot it were well my will. For he which was a bachelor, my father, is now made a peer, so when as ever that I came, and Ares' daughter now I am. This young king, which poised all her beauty and her wit withal, as he which was with love hent, anon thereto gaf his assent, he might not the place astert that she his lady of his hurt. So he took her to his wife to hold while that he hath life, and thus the king toward his knight accordeth him as it is right. And over this good is to white in the chronic as it is right. This noble king of whom I told of Spain by the days old. The kingdom had in governance, and as the book maketh remembrance, Alfonso was his proper name. The knight also, if I shall name, Don's Pedro Height, and as men tell, his daughter wise Petronel, was clepid, which was full of grace, and that was seen in Thilk Place, where she her father out of Tien hath brought and made herself a queen. Of that she hath so well disclosed the points whereof she was opposed. End of section 31, read by Bryce Cries, Youngstown, USA. Section 32 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paula Messina. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16, by Various. Ulysses S. Grant, 1822 to 1885 by Hamlin Garland. Ulysses Grant was born on the 27th of April, 1822, in a small two-room cabin situated in Point Pleasant, a village in southern Ohio, about 40 miles above Cincinnati. His father, Jesse R. Grant, was a powerful, alert, and resolute man, ready of speech and of fair education for the time. His family came from Connecticut and was of the earliest settlers in New England. Hannah Simpson, his wife, was of strong American stock also. The Simpsons had been residents for several generations of southeastern Pennsylvania. The Grants and the Simpsons had been redoubtable warriors in the early wars of the Republic. Hannah Simpson was a calm, equable, self-contained young woman as reticent and forbearing as her husband was disputatious and impetuous. Their first child was named Hiram Ulysses Grant. Before the child was two years of age, Jesse Grant, who was superintending a tannery in Point Pleasant, removed to Georgetown, Brown County, Ohio, and set up in business for himself. Georgetown was a village in the deep woods, and in and about this village, Ulysses Grant grew to be a sturdy, self-reliant boy. He loved horses and became a remarkable rider and teamster at a very early age. 
He was not notable as a scholar, but it was soon apparent that he had inherited the self-poise, the reticence, and the modest demeanor of his mother. He took part in the games and sports of the boys, but displayed no military traits whatever. At the age of seventeen, he was a fair scholar for his opportunities, and his ambitious father procured for him an appointment to the military academy at West Point. He reported at the adjutant's desk in June 1839, where he found his name on the register, Ulysses S. Grant, through a mistake of his congressman, Thomas L. Hamer. Meanwhile, to escape ridicule on the initials of his name, which spelled H-U-G, he had transposed his name to Ulysses H. Grant, and at his request, the adjutant changed the S to an H. But the name on record in Washington was Ulysses S., and so he remained U.S. Grant to the government and U.H. Grant to his friends and relatives. His record at West Point was a good one in mathematics and fair in most of his studies. He graduated at about the middle of his class, which numbered 39. He was much beloved and respected as an upright, honorable, and loyal young fellow. At the time of his graduation, he was president of the only literary society of the Academy. W.S. Hancock was its secretary. He remained markedly unmilitary throughout his course and was remembered mainly as a good comrade, a youth of sound judgment, and the finest horseman in the academy. He asked to be assigned to cavalry duty, but was breveted second lieutenant of the 4th Infantry and ordered to Jefferson Barracks, near St. Louis. Here he remained till the spring of 1844, when his regiment was ordered to a point on the southwestern frontier, near the present town of Nocatush, Louisiana. Here he remained till May 1845, when the Mexican War opened, and for the next three years he served with his regiment in every battle except Buena Vista. He was twice promoted for gallant conduct and demonstrated his great coolness, resource, and bravery in the hottest fire. He was regimental quartermaster much of the time and might honorably have kept out of battle but he contrived to be in the forefront with his command. In the autumn of 1848, he married Miss Julia Dent of St. Louis, and as first lieutenant and regimental quartermaster with a brevet of captain, he served at Sackett's Harbor and Detroit alternately till June 1852, when he was ordered to the coast. This was a genuine hardship, for he was unable to take his wife and child with him but he concluded to remain in the army and went with his command, sailing from New York and passing by the way of the Isthmus. On the way across the Isthmus, the regiment encountered cholera, and all Grant's coolness, resource, and bravery were required to get his charge safely across. He seemed never to think of himself and appeared to be a man of iron, his companion said. He was regimental quartermaster at Fort Vancouver, near Portland, Oregon, for one year. In 1853, he was promoted to a captaincy and ordered to Fort Humboldt, near Eureka in California, in 1854, becoming disheartened by the never-ending vista of barrack life and despairing of being able to have his wife and children with him, he sent in his resignation to take effect July 31, 1854. He had lost money by unfortunate business ventures, and so returned forlorn and penniless to New York. Thence he made his way to St. Louis to his wife and children, and began the world again as a farmer, without a house or tools or horses. His father-in-law, Mr. Frederick Dent, who lived about ten miles out of the city, set aside some sixty or eighty acres of land for his use and thereon he built with his own hands a log cabin, which he called Hard Scrabble. For nearly four years, he lived the life of a farmer. He plowed, hoed, cleared the land, hauled wood and props to the mines, and endured all the hardships and privations of a small farmer. In 1858, his health gave way, 
and he moved to St. Louis in the attempt to get into some less taxing occupation. He tried for the position of county engineer and failed. He went into the real estate business with a friend and failed in that. He secured a place in the customs office, but the collector died and he was thrown out of employment. In the spring of 1860, despairing of getting a foothold in St. Louis, he removed to Galena, Illinois, where his father had established a leather store, a branch of his tannery in Covington, Kentucky. Here he came in touch again with his two brothers, Simpson and Orville Grant. He became a clerk at a salary of $600 per annum. At this time, he was a quiet man of middle age, and his manner and mode of life attracted little attention till in 1861, when Sumter was fired upon and Lincoln called for volunteers. Galena at once held a war meeting to raise a company. Captain Grant, because of his military experience, was made president of the meeting and afterward was offered the captaincy of the company, which he refused, saying, I have been a captain in the regular army. I am fitted to command a regiment. He wrote at once a patriotic letter to his father-in-law wherein he said, I foresee the doom of slavery. He accompanied the company to Springfield, where his military experience was needed. Governor Richard Yates gave him work in the adjutant's office, then made him drill master at Camp Yates. And as his efficiency became apparent, he was appointed governor's aide with rank of colonel. He mustered in several regiments, among them the 7th Congressional Regiment at Mattoon. He made such an impression on this regiment that they named their camp in his honor, and about the middle of June sent a delegation of officers to ask that he be made colonel. Governor Yates reluctantly appointed him, and at the request of General John C. Fremont, the commander of the Department of the West, Grant's regiment, known as the 21st Illinois Volunteers, was ordered to Missouri. Colonel Grant marched his men overland, being the first commander of the state to decline railway transportation. His efficiency soon appeared, and he was given the command of all the troops in and about Mexico, Missouri. At this point, he received a dispatch from E.B. Washburn, congressman for his district, that President Lincoln had made him brigadier general. He was put in command at Ironton, Missouri and was proceeding against Colonel Hardy, when he was relieved from command by B. M. Prentice and ordered to Jefferson City, Missouri. He again brought order out of chaos, and was ready for a campaign, when he was again relieved, and by suggestion of President Lincoln, placed in command of a district with headquarters at Cairo, Illinois. This was his first adequate command and with clear and orderly activity he organized his command of nearly 10,000 men. On the 6th of September, learning that the Confederates were advancing on Paducah, he took the city without firing a gun, and issued an address to the people of Kentucky, which led Lincoln to say, The man who can write like that is fitted to command in the West. Early in November, in obedience to a command from Fremont, he fought the Battle of Belmont, thus preventing General Polk from reinforcing Price in Missouri. This was neither a victory nor a defeat, as the purpose was not to hold Belmont. In February 1862, with an army of 20,000 men and accompanied by Commander Foote's flotilla, he took Fort Henry and marched on Fort Donelson. On the 16th of the same month, he had invested Donelson and had beaten the enemy within their works. General Simon Buckner, his old classmate and comrade, was in command. He wrote to Grant, asking for commissioners to agree upon terms. Grant replied, No terms except an unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. Buckner surrendered, and Grant's sturdy words flamed over the land, making him unconditional surrender grant. The whole nation thrilled with the surprise and joy of this capture. 
and the obscure brigadier general became the hero of the day. He was made major general and given the command of the District of Western Tennessee. On the 6th and 7th of April, he fought the terrible Battle of Shiloh and won it, though with great loss. Owing to the failure of part of his reinforcements to arrive, immediately after this battle, General H. W. Hollick, who had relieved General Fremont as commander in the West, took command in person, and by a clever military device deprived Grant of all command, and for six weeks the army timidly advanced on Corinth. Corinth was evacuated by the enemy before Hollick dared to attack, and Grant had no hand in any important command until late in the year. Hollick went to Washington in July, leaving Grant again in command, but his forces were so depleted that he could do little but defend his lines and stores. In January 1863, he began to assemble his troops to attack Vicksburg, but high water kept him inactive till the following April. His plan, then fully developed, was to run the battery with gunboats and transports, march his troops across the peninsula before the city, and flank the enemy from below. This superbly audacious plan involved cutting loose from his base of supplies and all communications. He was obliged to whip two armies in detail, Johnston at Jackson, Mississippi, and Pemberton in command at Vicksburg. This marvelous campaign was executed to the letter, and on the third day of July, Pemberton surrendered the largest body of troops ever captured on this continent up to that time, and Grant became the man of destiny of the army. All criticism was silenced. The world's markets rose and fell with his daily doings. Lincoln wrote him a letter of congratulation. The question of making the prop hauler of the Gravois general-in-chief of all the armies of the United States was raised and all the nation turned to him as the savior of the republic. He was made commander of all the armies of the Mississippi and proceeded to Chattanooga to rescue Rosencrans and his beleaguered army. In a series of swift and dramatic battles, he captured Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge. Wherever he went, victory seemed to follow. His calm demeanor never changed. He was bent on whipping out the rebellion. He was seen to be a warrior of a new sort. He was never malignant or cruel or ungenerous to his enemies. But he fought battles to win them, and the country now clamored for him to lead the armies of the Potomac against Lee, the great southern general against whom no northern general seemed able to prevail. Early in March of 1864, Honorable E. B. Washburn introduced into Congress a bill reviving the grade of lieutenant general. It was passed by both houses with some discussion, and Lincoln conferred the title and all it implied upon Grant. He called him to Washington and placed the whole conduct of the war in his hands. I don't want to know your plans, he said. Grant became absolutely chief in command and set forth at once to direct the Army of the Potomac in person, and to encompass Lee as he had captured the armies of Buckner and Pemberton. His aim was not to whip Lee, but to destroy his army and end the war. He began an enormous encircling movement, which never for one moment relaxed. The Army of the Potomac retreated no more. It had a commander who never knew when he was beaten. He fought one day in the wilderness, sustaining enormous losses. But when the world expected retreat, he ordered an advance. He fought another day, and on the third day ordered an advance. Lincoln said, At last I have a general. Grant never rested. After every battle he advanced, inexorably closing around Lee. It took him a year but in the end, he won. He captured Lee's army and ended the war on the 9th of April, 1865. 
his terms with the captured general of the southern forces were so chivalrous and generous that it gained for him the respect and even admiration of the southern people they could not forget that he was conqueror but they acknowledged his greatness of heart he had no petty revenges nothing in human history exceeds the contrasts in the life of ulysses grant when lee surrendered to him he controlled a battle line from the potomac to the rio grande composed of a million men his lightest command had almost inconceivable power and yet he was the same man who had hauled wood in st louis and sold awls and shoe pegs in galena he had been developed by opportunity personally he remained simple to the point of inconspicuousness his rusty blouse his worn hat his dusty boots his low and modest voice gave no indication of his exalted position and his enormous power at the grand review of the armies in washington in may he sat with musing eyes while the victorious legions passed him so unobtrusive in the throng that his troops could hardly distinguish his form and face and when he returned to galena his old home he carried no visible sign of the power and glory to which he had won his way step by step by sheer power of doing things so well that other and greater duties were entrusted to his keeping he presented a new type of soldier to the world he was never vengeful never angry in battle when others swore and uttered ferocious cries grant remained master of himself and every faculty uttering no oath giving his commands in full clear simple dignified phrases he hated conflict he cared nothing for the pomp and circumstance of war it was not glorious to him and when it was all over he said i never want to see a soldier's uniform again he was the chief citizen of the republic at the close of the war and when lincoln was assassinated he was the mainstay of the republic every eye was turned upon him and his calmness was most salutary upon the nation he became inevitably a candidate for president and was elected with great enthusiasm in eighteen sixty eight in 1872 he was re-elected and during his two terms his one great purpose was to reconstruct the nation he did all that he could to heal the scars of war he stood between the malignants of the north and the helpless people of the south always patient and sympathetic his administrations ran in turbulent times and corruption was abroad in official circles but there is no evidence that he was touched by it. His administration was attacked. He was acquitted. In 1878, two years after his second term had ended, he went on a trip around the world, visiting all the great courts and kings of the leading nations. He received the most extraordinary honors ever tendered to one human being by his fellows, but he returned to Galena and to his boyhood home the same good neighbor, just as democratic in his intercourse as ever. He never forgot a face, whether of the man who shot his horses or of the man who nominated him for president, though he looked upon more people than any other man in the history of the world. In 1880, he mistakenly became a candidate for a third term and was defeated. Shortly after this, he moved to New York City and became a nominal partner in the firm of Grant and Ward. His name was used in the business. He had little connection with it, for he was growing old and failing in health. In May 1884, through the rascality of Ferdinand Ward, the firm failed, and General Grant lost every dollar he owned. Just before the crash, in the attempt to save the firm, he went to a wealthy friend and borrowed a large sum of money. After the failure, the grim old commander turned over to his creditor every trophy, every present which had been given him by his foreign friends, even the jeweled favors of kings and queens and the swords presented to him by his fellow citizens, 
and by his soldiers. He reserved nothing. He became so poor that his pew rent became a burden, and the question of earning a living came to him with added force, for he was old and lame, and attacked by cancer of the tongue. Now came the most heroic year of his life, suffering almost ceaseless pain with the death shadow on him. He sat down to write his autobiography for the benefit of his wife. He complained not at all, and allowed nothing to stand in the way of his work. He wrote on steadily, up to the very day of his death, long after the power of speech was gone, revising his proofs, correcting his judgments of commanders as new evidence arose, and in the end, producing a book which was a marvel of simple sincerity and modesty of statement, and of transparent clarity of style. It took rank at once as one of the great martial biographies of the world. It redeemed his name and gave his wife a competency. It was a greater deed than the taking of Vicksburg. In this final illness, his thoughts dwelt much upon the differences between the North and the South. From Mount McGregor, where he was taken in June 1885 to escape the heat of the city, he sent forth repeated messages of goodwill to the South. In this hour, the two mighty purposes of his life grew clearer in men's minds. He had put down the rebellion, and from the moment of Lee's surrender, had set himself the task of reuniting the severed nation. Let us have peace, he said, and the saying had all the effect of a benediction. He died on July 23rd, 1885 at the age of sixty-three, and at his grave the North and the South stood side by side in friendship, and the great captains of opposing armies walked shoulder to shoulder, bearing his body to its final rest on the bank of the Hudson River. The world knew his faults, his mistakes, and his weaknesses, but they were all forgotten in the memory of his great deeds as a warrior, and of his gentleness modesty, candor, and purity as a man. Since then, it becomes increasingly more evident that he is to take his place as one of the three or four figures of the first class in our national history. He was a man of action, and his deeds were of the kind which mark epochs in history. End of section 32. Section 33 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16, by Various. Excerpts from the Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant Early Life from Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant Copyright by Ulysses S. Grant and reprinted by permission of the family of General Grant In June 1821, my father, Jesse R. Grant, married Hannah Simpson. I was born on the 27th of April, 1822, at Point Pleasant, Claremont County, Ohio. In the fall of 1823, we moved to Georgetown, the county seat of Brown, the adjoining county east. This place remained my home until at the age of 17, in 1839, I went to West Point. The schools at the time of which I write were very indifferent. There were no free schools, and none in which the scholars were classified. They were all supported by subscription, and a single teacher, who was often a man or a woman incapable of teaching much, even if they imparted all they knew, would have 30 or 40 scholars, male and female, from the infant learning the ABCs up to the young lady of 18 and the boy of 20, studying the highest branches taught, the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. I never saw an algebra or other mathematical work higher than the arithmetic in Georgetown until after I was appointed to West Point. 
I then bought a work on algebra in Cincinnati, but having no teacher, it was Greek to me. My life in Georgetown was uneventful. From the age of five or six until 17, I attended the subscription schools of the village, except during the winters of 1836 to 7 and 1838 to 9. The former period was spent in Maysville, Kentucky, attending the school of Richardson and Rand, the latter in Ripley, Ohio, at a private school. I was not studious in habit and probably did not make progress enough to compensate for the outlay for board and tuition. At all events, both winters were spent in going over the same old arithmetic, which I knew every word of before, and repeating, a noun is the name of a thing, which I had also heard my Georgetown teachers repeat until I had come to believe it. But I cast no reflections upon my old teacher, Richardson. He turned out bright scholars from his school, many of whom had filled conspicuous places in the service of their states. Two of my contemporaries there, who I believe never attended any other institution of learning, have held seats in Congress, and one, if not both, other high offices. These are Wadsworth and Brewster. My father was from my earliest recollection in comfortable circumstances, considering the times, his place of residence, and the community in which he lived. Mindful of his own lack of facilities for acquiring an education, his greatest desire in mature years was for the education of his children. Consequently, as stated before, I never missed a quarter from school, from the time I was old enough to attend till the time of leaving home. This did not exempt me from labor. In my early days, everyone labored more or less. In the region where my youth was spent, and more in proportion to their private means. It was only the very poor who were exempt. While my father carried on the manufacture of leather and worked at the trade himself, he owned and tilled considerable land. I detested the trade, preferring almost any other labor, but I was fond of agriculture and of all the employment in which horses were used. We had, among other lands, 50 acres of forest within a mile of the village. In the fall of the year, choppers were employed to cut enough wood to last a 12 month. When I was seven or eight years of age, I began hauling all the wood used in the house and shops. I could not load it on the wagons, of course, at that time, but I could drive, and the choppers would load, and someone at the house unload. When about 11 years old, I was strong enough to hold a plow. From that age until 17, I did all the work done with horses, such as breaking up the land, furrowing, plowing corn and potatoes, bringing in the crops when harvested, hauling all the wood, besides tending two or three horses, a cow or two, and sawing wood for stoves, etc., while still attending school. For this, I was compensated by the fact that there was never any scolding or punishing by my parents, no objection to rational enjoyments, such as fishing, going to the creek a mile away to swim in summer, taking a horse and visiting my grandparents in the adjoining county, 15 miles off, skating on the ice in winter, or taking a horse and sleigh when there was snow on the ground. While still quite young, I had visited Cincinnati, 45 miles away, several times alone. Also Maysville, Kentucky, often, and once Louisville. The journey to Louisville was a big one for a boy of that day. I had also gone once with a two-horse carriage to Chillicoth, about 70 miles, with a neighbor's family who were removing to Toledo, Ohio, and returned alone, and had gone once in like manner to Flat Rock, Kentucky about 70 miles away. On this latter occasion, I was 15 years of age, while at Flat Rock at the house of a Mr. Payne, whom I was visiting with his brother, a neighbor of ours in Georgetown. I saw a very fine saddle horse, which I rather coveted, and proposed to Mr. Payne, the owner, to trade him for one of the two I was driving. 
Payne hesitated to trade with a boy, but asking his brother about it, the latter told him that it would be all right, that I was allowed to do as I pleased with the horses. I was seventy miles from home, with a carriage to take back, and Mr. Payne said he did not know that his horse had ever had a collar on. I asked to have him hitched to a farm wagon, and we would soon see whether he could work. It was soon evident that the horse had never worn harness before, but he showed no viciousness, and I expressed a confidence that I could manage him. A trade was at once struck, I receiving ten dollars difference. The next day, Mr. Payne of Georgetown and I started on our return. We got along very well for a few miles, when we encountered a ferocious dog that frightened the horses and made them run. The new animal kicked at every jump he made. I got the horses stopped, however, before any damage was done, and without running into anything. After giving them a little rest to quiet their fears, we started again. That instant, the new horse kicked and started to run once more. The road we were stuck on, the turnpike within half a mile of the point where the second runaway commenced and there was an embankment twenty or more feet deep on the opposite side of the pike. I got the horses stopped on the very brink of the precipice. My new horse was terribly frightened and trembled like an aspen, but he was not so badly frightened as my companion, Mr. Payne, who deserted me after this last experience and took passage on a freight wagon for Maysville. Every time I attempted to start, my new horse would commence to kick, I was in quite a dilemma for a time. Once in Maysville, I could borrow a horse from an uncle who lived there, but I was more than a day's travel from that point. Finally, I took out my bandana, the style of handkerchief in universal use then, and with this blindfolded my horse. In this way, I reached Maysville safely the next day, no doubt much to the surprise of my friend. Here I borrowed a horse from my uncle, and the following day we proceeded on our journey. About half my school days in Georgetown was spent at the school of John D. White, a North Carolinian, and the father of Chilton White, who represented the district in Congress for one term during the rebellion. Mr. White was always a Democrat in politics, and Chilton followed his father. He had two older brothers, all three being schoolmates of mine at their father's school, who did not go the same way. The second brother died before the rebellion began. He was a Whig, and afterwards a Republican. His oldest brother was a Republican and brave soldier during the rebellion. Chilton is reported as having told of an earlier horse trade of mine. As he told the story, there was a Mr. Ralston living within a few miles of the village who owned a colt I very much wanted. My father had offered twenty dollars for it, but Ralston wanted twenty-five. I was so anxious to have the colt that after the owner left, I begged to be allowed to take him at the price demanded. My father yielded, but said twenty dollars was all the horse was worth and told me to offer that price. If it was not accepted, I was to offer twenty-two and a half, and if that would not get him, to give the twenty-five. I at once mounted a horse and went for the colt. When I got to Mr. Ralston's house, I said to him, Papa says, I may offer you twenty dollars for the colt, but if you won't take that, I am to offer twenty-two and a half, and if you won't take that, to give you twenty-five. It would not require a Connecticut man to guess the price finally agreed upon. This story is nearly true. I certainly showed very plainly that I had come for the cult and meant to have him. I could not have been over eight years old at the time. This transaction caused me great heart burning. The story got out among the boys of the village, and it was a long time before I heard the last of it. Boys enjoy the misery of their companions. At least village boys in that day did, and in later life I have found that all adults are not free from the peculiarity. I kept the horse until he was four years old, when he went blind, 
and I sold him for $20 when I went to Maysville to school in 1836 at the age of 14. I recognized my colt as one of the blind horses working on the tread wheel of the ferry boat. I have described enough of my early life to give an impression of the whole. I did not like to work, but I did as much of it, while young, as grown men can be hired to do in these days, and attended school at the same time. I had as many privileges as any boy in the village, and probably more than most of them. I have no recollection of ever having been punished at home, either by scolding or by the rod. But at school, the case was different. The rod was freely used there, and I was not exempt from its influence. I can see John D. White, the school teacher now, with his long beach switch always in his hand. It was not always the same one, either. Switches were brought in bundles from a beech wood near the schoolhouse by the boys for whose benefit they were intended. Often a whole bundle would be used up in a single day. I never had any hard feelings against my teacher, either while attending the school or in later years when reflecting upon my experience. Mr. White was a kind-hearted man and was much respected by the community in which he lived. He only followed the universal custom of the period and that under which he had received his own education. In the winter of 1838-39, to I was attending school at Ripley, only ten miles distant from Georgetown, but spent the Christmas holidays at home. During this vacation, my father received a letter from the Honorable Thomas Morris, then United States Senator from Ohio. When he read it, he said to me, Ulysses, I believe you are going to receive the appointment. What appointment, I inquired. To West Point, I have applied for it. But I won't go, I said. He said... He thought I would, and I thought so too if he did. I really had no objection to going to West Point, except that I had a very exalted idea of the acquirements necessary to get through. I did not believe I possessed them, and could not bear the idea of failing. Grant's Courtship At West Point I had a classmate. In the last year of our studies, he was a roommate also. F.T. Dent whose family resided some five miles west of Jefferson Barracks. Two of his unmarried brothers were living at home at that time, and as I had taken with me from Ohio my horse, saddle, and bridle, I soon found my way out to Whitehaven, the name of the Dent estate. As I found the family congenial, my visits became frequent. They were at home besides the young men, two daughters, one a school miss of fifteen, the other a girl of eight or nine. There was still an older daughter of seventeen, who had been spending several years at a boarding school in St. Louis, but who, though through school, had not yet returned home. She was spending the winter in the city with connections, the family of Colonel John O'Fallon, well known in St. Louis. In February, she returned to her country home, After that, I do not know, but my visits became more frequent. They certainly did become more enjoyable. We would often take walks or go on horseback to visit the neighbors until I became quite well acquainted in that vicinity. Sometimes one of the brothers would accompany us, sometimes one of the younger sisters. If the 4th Infantry had remained at Jefferson Barracks, it is possible, even probable, that this life might have continued for some years without my finding out that there was anything serious the matter with me. But in the following May, a circumstance occurred which developed my sentiment so palpably that there was no mistaking it. The annexation of Texas was at this time the subject of violent discussion in Congress, in the press, and by individuals. The administration of President Tyler then in power, was making the most strenuous efforts to effect the annexation, which was indeed the great and absorbing question of the day. During these discussions, the greater part of the single rifle regiment in the army, the Second Dragoons, which had been dismounted a year or two before and designated 
dismounted rifles were stationed at Fort Jessup, Louisiana, some 25 miles east of the Texas line, to observe the frontier. About the 1st of May, the 3rd Infantry was ordered from Jefferson Barracks to Louisiana to go into camp in the neighborhood of Fort Jessup and there await further orders. The troops were embarked on steamers and were on their way down the Mississippi within a few days after the receipt of this order. About the time they started, I obtained a leave of absence for 20 days to go to Ohio to visit my parents. I was obliged to go to St. Louis to take a steamer for Louisville or Cincinnati, or the first steamer going up the Ohio River to any point. Before I left St. Louis, orders were received at Jefferson Barracks for the 4th Infantry to follow the 3rd. A messenger was sent after me to stop my leaving, but before he could reach me, I was off, totally ignorant of these events. A day or two after my arrival at Bethel, I received a letter from a classmate and fellow lieutenant in the 4th, informing me of the circumstances related above and advising me not to open any letter, postmark St. Louis, or Jefferson Barracks, until the expiration of my leave, and saying that he would pack up my things and take them along for me. His advice was not necessary, for no other letter was sent to me. I now discovered that I was exceedingly anxious to get back to Jefferson Barracks, and I understood the reason without explanation from anyone. My leave of absence required me to report for duty at Jefferson Barracks at the end of 20 days. I knew my regiment had gone up the Red River, but I was not disposed to break the letter of my leave. Besides, if I had proceeded to Louisiana direct, I could not have reached there until after the expiration of my leave. Accordingly, at the end of the 20 days, I reported for duty to Lieutenant Ewell commanding at Jefferson Barracks, handing him at the same time my leave of absence. After noticing the phraseology of the order, leaves of absence were generally worded, at the end of which time he will report for duty with his proper command. He said he would give me an order to join my regiment in Louisiana. I then asked for a few days' leave before starting, which he readily granted. This was the same Ewell, who acquired considerable reputation as a Confederate general during the rebellion. He was a man much esteemed, and deservedly so, in the old army, and proved himself a gallant and efficient officer in two wars, both, in my estimation, unholy. I immediately procured a horse and started for the country, taking no baggage with me, of course. There is an insignificant creek, the Gavois, between Jefferson Barracks and the place to which I was going, and at that day there was not a bridge over it from its source to its mouth. There is not water enough in the creek at ordinary stages to run a coffee mill, and at low water there is none running whatever. On this occasion it had been raining heavily, and when the creek was reached I found the banks full to overflowing, and the current rapid. I looked at it a moment to consider what to do. One of my superstitions had always been when I started to go anywhere or do anything, not to turn back or stop until the thing intended was accomplished. I have frequently started to go to places where I had never been and to which I did not know the way, depending upon making inquiries on the road. And if I got past the place without knowing it, instead of turning back, I would go on until the road was found turning in the right direction, take that, and come in by the other side. So I struck into the stream, and in an instant, the horse was swimming and I being carried down by the current. I headed the horse towards the other bank and soon reached it, wet through and without other clothes on that side of the stream. I went on, however, to my destination and borrowed a dry suit from my future brother-in-law. We were not of the same size, but the clothes answered every purpose until I got more of my own. Before I returned, I mustered up courage to make known, in the most awkward manner imaginable, the discovery I had made on learning that the 4th Infantry 
had been ordered away from Jefferson Barracks. The young lady afterwards admitted that she too, although until then she had never looked upon me, other than as a visitor whose company was agreeable to her, had experienced a depression of spirit she could not account for when the regiment left. Before separating, it was definitely understood that at a convenient time we would join our fortunes and not let the removal of a regiment trouble us. This was in May 1844. It was 22nd of August, 1848, before the fulfillment of this agreement. My duties kept me on the frontier of Louisiana with the Army of Observation during the pendency of annexation. And afterwards, I was absent through the war with Mexico, provoked by the action of the Army, if not by the annexation itself. During that time, there was a constant correspondence between Miss Stanton and myself but we only met once in the period of four years and three months. In May, 1845, I procured a leave for 20 days, visited St. Louis, and obtained the consent of the parents for the union, which had not been asked for before. A Texan Experience I had never been a sportsman in my life, had scarcely ever gone in search of game, and rarely seen anyone looking for it. On this trip, there was no minute of time. While traveling between San Patricio and the settlements on the San Antonio River, from San Antonio to Austin, and again from the Colorado River back to San Patricio, when deer or antelope could not be seen in great numbers, each officer carried a shotgun, and every evening after going into camp, some would go out and soon return with venison and wild turkeys, enough for the entire camp. I, however, never went out and had no occasion to fire my gun, except being detained over a day at Goliad. Benjamin and I concluded to go down to the creek, which was fringed with timber, much of it the pecan, and bring back a few turkeys. We had scarcely reached the edge of the timber when I heard the flutter of wings overhead, and in an instant, I saw two or three turkeys flying away. These were soon followed by more, then more and more, until a flock of twenty or thirty had left from just over my head. All this time, I stood watching the turkeys to see where they flew. With my gun on my shoulder, I never once thought of leveling it at the birds. When I had time to reflect upon the matter, I came to the conclusion that as a sportsman, I was a failure and went back to the house. Benjamin remained out and got as many turkeys as he wanted to carry back. After the second night at Goliad, Benjamin and I started to make the remainder of the journey alone. We reached Corpus Christi just in time to avoid absence without leave. We met no one, not even an Indian, during the remainder of our journey, except at San Patricio. A new settlement had been started there in our absence of three weeks, induced possibly by the fact that there were houses already built, while the proximity of troops gave protection against the Indians. On the evening of the first day out from Goliad, we heard the most unearthly howling of wolves directly in our front. The prairie grass was tall and we could not see the beasts, but the sound indicated that they were near. To my ear it appeared that there must have been enough of them to devour our party, horses and all, at a single meal. The part of Ohio that I hailed from was not thickly settled, but wolves had been driven out long before I left. Benjamin was from Indiana, still less populated, where the wolf yet roamed over the prairies. He understood the nature of the animal and the capacity of a few to make believe there was an unlimited number of them. He kept on towards the noise, unmoved. I followed in his trail, lacking moral courage to turn back and join our sick companion. I have no doubt that if Benjamin had proposed returning to Goliad, I would not only have seconded the motion, but have suggested that it was very hard-hearted in us to leave August sick there in the first place. But Benjamin did not propose turning back. When he did speak, it was to ask, Grant, 
How many wolves do you think there are in that pack? Knowing where he was from, and suspecting that he thought I would overestimate the number, I determined to show my acquaintance with the animal by putting the estimate below what possibly could be correct, and answered, oh, about twenty, very indifferently. He smiled and rode on. In a minute we were close upon them, and before they saw us, they were just two of them, seated upon their haunches, with their mouths close together. They had made all the noise we had been hearing for the past ten minutes. I have often thought of this incident since, when I have heard the noise of a few disappointed politicians who had deserted their associates. There are always more of them before they are counted. The Surrender of General Lee Wars produce many stories of fiction, some of which are told until they are believed to be true. The War of the Rebellion was no exception to this rule, and the story of the apple tree is one of those fictions based on a slight foundation of fact. As I have said, there was an apple orchard on the side of the hill occupied by the Confederate forces. Running diagonally up the hill was a wagon road, which at one point ran very near one of the trees, so that the wheels of vehicles had on that side cut off the roots of this tree, leaving a little embankment. General Babcock, of my staff, reported to me that when he first met General Lee, he was sitting upon this embankment with his feet in the road below and his back resting against the tree. The story had no other foundation than that. Like many other stories, it would be very good if it was only true. I had known General Lee in the old army and had served with him in the Mexican War, but did not suppose, owing to the difference in our age and rank, that he would remember me. Well, I would more naturally remember him distinctly, because he was the chief of staff of General Scott in the Mexican War. When I had left camp that morning, I had not expected so soon the result that was then taking place, and consequently was in rough garb. I was without a sword, as I usually was when on horseback on the field, and wore a soldier's blouse for a coat, with the shoulder straps of my rank to indicate to the army who I was. When I went into the house, I found General Lee. We greeted each other, and after shaking hands, took our seats. I had my staff with me, a good portion of whom were in the room during the whole of the interview. What General Lee's feelings were, I do not know, as he was a man of much dignity, with an impassable face. It was impossible to say whether he felt inwardly glad that the end had finally come, or felt sad over the result, and was too manly to show it. Whatever his feelings, they were entirely concealed from my observation. But my own feelings, which had been quite jubilant on the receipt of his letter, were sad and depressed. I felt like anything rather than rejoicing at the downfall of a foe, who had fought so long and valiantly, and had suffered so much for a cause, though that cause was, I believe, one of the worst for which a people ever fought, and one for which there was the least excuse. I do not question, however, the sincerity of the great mass of those who were opposed to us. General Lee was dressed in a full uniform which was entirely new, and was wearing a sword of considerable value. Very likely the sword which had been presented by the state of Virginia. At all events, it was an entirely different sword from the one that would ordinarily be worn in the field. In my rough traveling suit, the uniform of a private with the straps of a lieutenant general, I must have contrasted very strangely with the man, so handsomely dressed, six feet high, and a faultless form. But this was not a matter that I thought of until afterwards. We soon fell into a conversation about old army times. He remarked that he remembered me very well in the old army, and I told him that as a matter of course, I remembered him perfectly, but from the difference in our rank and years, there being about sixteen years difference in our ages, I had thought it very likely that I had not attracted his attention sufficiently to be remembered by him after such a long interval. 
Our conversation grew so pleasant that I almost forgot the object of our meeting. After the conversation had run on in this style for some time, General Lee called my attention to the object of our meeting and said that he had asked for this interview for the purpose of getting from me the terms I proposed to give his army. I said that I meant merely that his army should lay down their arms, not to take them up again during the continuance of the war unless duly and properly exchanged. He said that he had so understood my letter. Then we gradually fell off again into conversation about matters foreign to the subject, which had brought us together. This continued for some little time, when General Lee again interrupted the course of the conversation by suggesting that the terms I had proposed to give his army ought to be written out. I called to General Parker, secretary on my staff, for writing materials, and commenced writing out the following terms. Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, April 9, 1865. General R. E. Lee, commanding CSA. General, in accordance with the substance of my letter to you of the 8th inst, I propose to receive the surrender of the Army of North Virginia on the following terms, to wit, rolls of all the officers and men to be made in duplicate, one copy to be given to an officer designated by me, the other to be retained by such officer or officers as you may designate, the officers to give their individual paroles, not to take up arms against the government of the United States until properly exchanged, and each company or regimental commander sign a like parole for the men of their commands. The arms, artillery, and public property to be parked and stacked, and turned over to the officer appointed by me to receive them. This will not embrace the side arms of the officers, nor their private horses or baggage. This done, each officer and man will be allowed to return to their homes, not to be disturbed by United States authority, so long as they observe their paroles and the laws in force where they may reside. Very respectfully, U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General. When I put my pen to the paper, I did not know the first word that I should make use of in writing the terms. I only knew what was in my mind, and I wished to express it clearly so that there could be no mistaking it. As I wrote on, the thought occurred to me that the officers had their own private horses and effects, which were important to them, but of no value to us. Also, that it would be unnecessary humiliation to call upon them to deliver their sidearms. No conversation, not one word, passed between General Lee and myself, either about private property, sidearms, or kindred subjects. He appeared to have no objections to the terms first proposed, or if he had a point to make against them, he wished to wait until they were in writing to make it. When he read over that part of the terms about sidearms, horses, and private property of the officers, he remarked, with some feeling, I thought, that this would have a happy effect upon his army. Then, after a little further conversation, General Lee remarked to me again that their army was organized a little differently from the Army of the United States, still maintaining by implication that we were two countries, that in their army the cavalrymen and artillerists owned their own horses, and he asked if he was to understand that the men who so owned their horses were to be permitted to retain them. I told him that as the terms were written they would not, that only the officers were permitted to take their private property. He then, after reading of the terms a second time, remarked that that was clear. I then said to him that I thought this would be about the last battle of the war. I sincerely hoped so. And I said further, I took it that most of the men in the ranks were small farmers. The whole country had been so raided by the two armies that it was doubtful whether they would be able to put in a crop to carry themselves and their families through the next winter without the aid of the horses they were then riding. The United States did not want them, and I would therefore instruct the officers I left behind to receive the paroles of his troops, 
to let every man of the Confederate Army who claimed to own a horse or mule take the animal to his home. Lee remarked again that this would have a happy effect. He then sat down and wrote out the following letter. Headquarters Army of Northern Virginia, April 9th, 1865. General, I received your letter of this date containing the terms of the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia, as proposed by you. As they are substantially the same as those expressed in your letter of the 8th inst, they are accepted. I will proceed to designate the proper officers to carry the stipulations into effect. R. E. Lee, General. Lieutenant General U.S. Grant. While duplicates of the two letters were being made, the Union generals present were severally presented to General Lee. The much talked of surrendering of Lee's sword and my handing it back, this and much more that has been said about it, is the purest romance. The word sword or sidearms was not mentioned by either of us until I wrote it in the terms. There was no premeditation, and it did not occur to me until the moment I wrote it down. If I had happened to admit it, and General Lee had called my attention to it, I should have put it in the terms, precisely as I acceded to the provision about the soldiers retaining their horses. General Lee, after all was completed before taking his leave, remarked that his army was in a very bad condition for want of food, and that they were without forage, that his men had been living for some days on parched corn exclusively, and that he would have to ask me for rations and forage. I told him, certainly, and asked for how many men he wanted rations. His answer was, about 25,000. And I authorized him to send his own commissary and quartermaster to Appomattox Station, two or three miles away, where he could have, out of the trains we had stopped, all the provisions wanted. As for forage, we had ourselves depended almost entirely upon the country for that. Generals Gibbon, Griffin, and Merritt were designated by me to carry into effect the paroling of Lee's troops before they should start for their homes. General Lee leaving Generals Longstreet, Gordon, and Pendleton for them to confer with in order to facilitate this work. Lee and I then separated as cordially as we had met, he returning to his own lines, and all went into bivouac for the night at Appomattox. End of section 33. Section 34 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16, by Various. Selected excerpts by Henry Grattan. 1746 to 1820. Henry Grattan, eminent among Irish orators and statesmen, was born in Dublin July 3rd, 1746. He graduated from Trinity College in 1767, became a law student at the Middle Temple, London, and was admitted to the bar in 1772. He soon became drawn into open political life entering the Irish Parliament in 1775. In Parliament, he espoused the popular cause. His memorable displays of oratory followed fast and plentifully. On April 19, 1780, he attacked the right of England to legislate for Ireland. With that address, his reputation was made. He became incessant in his efforts to remove oppressive legislation, By his eloquence, he quickened into life a national spirit to culminate in a convention at Dungannon on February 15, 1782, where resolutions in favor of legislative independence were stormily adopted. Presently, after a speech of surpassing power from him, the Declaration of Rights Bill was passed unanimously by both houses, 
with an unwilling enactment from England. The idol now of Ireland, Grattan was voted by his Parliament a grant of £50,000 as a testimony of national gratitude for great national services. The next 18 years saw him resolute to secure for Ireland liberal laws, greater commercial freedom, better conditions for the peasantry, the wiping out of parliamentary corruption, and especially the absolute emancipation of the Roman Catholics. After the Union, he lived in retirement, devoting himself to the study of the classics and to the education of his children until 1805. Then, at the request of Fox, he entered the imperial parliament, making his first speech in favor of Fox's motion for a committee on the Roman Catholic petition, an address described as one of the most brilliant speeches ever made within the walls of Parliament. In 1806, he was elected a member for Dublin, which city he represented until his decease. His last speech was made on May 5, 1819, in favor of Roman Catholic emancipation. It is to be noted that he was, by profession and conviction, a Protestant. He died in 1820. He was buried in Westminster Abbey, near the graves of Chatham and Fox. In spite of great natural drawbacks, Grattan achieved the highest rank as an orator, and his passionate eloquence has rarely been equaled in fervor and originality. On the character of Chatham, the secretary stood alone. Modern degeneracy had not reached him. Original and unaccommodating, the features of his character had the hardihood of antiquity. His august mind overawed majesty, and one of his sovereigns thought royalty so impaired in his presence that he conspired to remove him in order to be relieved from his superiority. No state chicanery, no narrow system of vicious politics sank him to the vulgar level of the great, but overbearing, persuasive, and impracticable. His object was England, his ambition was fame, Without dividing, he destroyed party. Without corrupting, he made a venal age unanimous. France sank beneath him. With one hand, he smote the House of Bourbon and wielded with the other the democracy of England. The sight of his mind was infinite, and his schemes were to affect not England and the present age only, but Europe and posterity. Wonderful were the means by which these schemes were accomplished always seasonable, always adequate, the suggestions of an understanding animated by order and enlightened by prophecy, the ordinary feelings which render life amiable and indolent were unknown to him. No domestic difficulty, no domestic weakness reached him, but aloof from the sordid occurrences of life and unsullied by its intercourse, he came occasionally into our system to counsel and to decide. A character so exalted, so strenuous, so various, and so authoritative astonished a corrupt age, and the treasury trembled at the name of Pitt, through all her classes of venality. Corruption imagined indeed that she had found defects in this statesman, and talked much of the ruin of his victories, but the history of his country and the calamities of the enemy refuted her. Nor were his political abilities his only talents. His eloquence was an error in the Senate, peculiar and spontaneous, familiarly expressing gigantic sentiments and instinctive wisdom, not like the torrent of Demosthenes or the splendid conflagration of Tully. It resembled sometimes the thunder and sometimes the music of the spheres. He did not, like Murray, conduct the understanding through the painful subtlety of argumentation, nor was he, like Townsend, forever on the rack of exertion, but rather lightened upon the subject and reached the point by flashings of the mind, which, like those of his eye, were felt but could not be followed. Upon the whole, there was something in this man that could create, subvert, or reform, an understanding, a spirit, and an eloquence, 
to summon mankind to society, or to break the bonds of slavery asunder, and to rule the wilderness of free minds with unbounded authority, something that could establish or overwhelm empires and strike a blow in the world which should resound throughout the universe. Of the injustice of disqualification of Catholics, from the speech of May 31st, 1811, whatever belongs to the authority of God or to the laws of nature is necessarily beyond the province and sphere of human institution and government. The Roman Catholic, when you disqualify him on the ground of his religion, may, with great justice, tell you that you are not his God, that he cannot mold or fashion his faith by your decrees. You may inflict penalties, and he may suffer them in silence. But if Parliament assume the prerogative of heaven and enact laws to impose upon the people a different religion, the people will not obey such laws. If you pass an act to impose a tax or regulate a duty, the people can go to the roll to learn what are the provisions of the law. But whenever you take upon yourselves to legislate for God, though there may be truth in your enactments, you have no authority to enforce them. In such a case, the people will not go to the roll of Parliament, but to the Bible, the testament of God's will, to ascertain his law and their duty. When once man goes out of his sphere and says he will legislate for God, he in fact makes himself God. But this I do not charge upon the Parliament, because in none of the penal acts has the Parliament imposed a religious creed. It is not to be traced in the qualification oath, nor in the declaration required. The qualifying oath, as to the great number of offices and seats in Parliament, scrupulously evades religious distinctions. A dissenter of any class may take it. A deist, an atheist, may likewise take it. The Catholics are alone accepted. And for what reason? Certainly not because the internal character of the Catholic religion is inherently vicious. Not because it necessarily incapacitates those who profess it to make laws for their fellow citizens. If a deist be fit to sit in Parliament, it can hardly be urged that a Christian is unfit. If an atheist be competent to legislate for his country, Surely this privilege cannot be denied to the believer in the divinity of our Savior. But let me ask you, if you have forgotten, what was the faith of your ancestors, or if you are prepared to assert that the men who procured your liberties are unfit to make your laws? Or do you forget the tempest by which the dissenting classes of the community were at a former period agitated, or in what manner you fix the rule of peace over that wild scene of anarchy and commotion. If we attend to the present condition and habits of these classes, do we not find their controversy subsisting in full vigor? And can it be said that their jarring sentiments and clashing interests are productive of any disorder in the state, or that the Methodist himself in all his noisy familiarity with his maker, is a dangerous or disloyal subject. Upon what principle can it be argued that the application of a similar policy would not conciliate the Catholics and promote the general interest of the empire? I can trace the continuance of their incapacities to nothing else than a political combination, a combination that condemned the Catholic religion, not as a heresy, but as a symptom of civil alienation. By this doctrine, the religion is not so much an evil in itself as a perpetual token of political disaffection. In the spirit of this liberal interpretation, you once decreed to take away their arms, or on another occasion, ordered all papers to be removed from London. In the whole subsequent course of administration, the religion has continued to be esteemed the infallible symptom of a propensity to rebel. No nor suspected papists were once the objects of the severest jealousy and the bitterest enactments. 
some of these statutes have been repealed, and the jealousy has since somewhat abated. But the same suspicions, although in a less degree, pervade your counsels. Your imaginations are still infected with apprehensions of the proneness of the Catholics to make cause with a foreign foe. A treaty has lately been made with the King of the Two Sicilies. May I ask, is his religion the evidence of the warmth of his attachment to your alliance? Does it enter into your calculation as one of the motives that must incline him to our friendship, in preference to the friendship of the state professing his own faith? A similar treaty has been recently entered into with the Prince Regent of Portugal, professing the Roman Catholic religion, and one million granted last year and two millions this session for the defense of Portugal. Nay, even in the treaty with the Prince Regent of Portugal, there is an article which stipulates that we shall not make peace with France unless Portugal shall be restored to the House of Braganza. And has the Prince of Brazil's religion been considered evidence of his connection with the enemy? You have not one ally who is not Catholic, and will you continue to disqualify Irish Catholics who fight with you and your allies because their religion is evidence of disaffection? But if the Catholic religion be this evidence of repugnance, is Protestantism the proof of affection to the crown and government of England? For an answer, let us look at America. In vain did you send your armies there. In vain did you appeal to the ties of common origin and common religion. America joined with France and adopted a connection with the Catholic government. Turn to Prussia and behold whether her religion has had any effect on her political character. Did the faith of Denmark prevent the attack on Copenhagen? It is admitted on all sides that the Catholics have demonstrated their allegiance in as strong a manner as the willing expenditure of blood and treasure can events. And remember that the French go not near so far in their defense of Catholicism as you and your hatred of it in your own subjects and your reverence for it in your allies. They have not scrupled to pull down the ancient fabrics of superstition in the country subjected to their arms. Upon a review of these facts, I am justified in assuming that there is nothing inherent in Catholicism which either proves disaffection or disqualifies for public trusts. The immediate inference is that they have as much right as any dissentient sect to the enjoyment of civil privileges and participation of equal rights, that they are as fit morally and politically to hold offices in the state or seats in Parliament. Those who dispute the conclusion will find it their duty to controvert the reasoning on which it is founded. I do not believe the Church is in any danger, but if it is, I am sure that we are in a wrong way to secure it. If our laws will battle against providence, there can be no doubt of the issue of the conflict between the ordinances of God and the decrees of man. Transient must be the struggle, rapid the event. Let us suppose an extreme case, but applicable to the present point. Suppose the Thames were to inundate its banks, and suddenly swelling, entered this house during our deliberations, an event which I greatly deprecate for my private friendship with many members who might happen to be present, and my sense of the great exertions which many of them have made for the public interest, and a motion of adjournment being made should be opposed, and an address to Providence moved that it would be graciously pleased to turn back the overflow and direct the waters into another channel. This, it will be said, would be absurd." But consider whether you are acting upon a principle of greater intrinsic wisdom. When after provoking the resentments, you arm and martialize the ambition of men, under the vain assurance that providence will work a miracle in the constitution of human nature, and dispose it to pay injustice with affection, oppression with cordial support. This is, in fact, the true character of your expectations, nothing less than that the author of the universe should subvert his laws to ratify your statutes 
and disturbed the subtle course of nature to confirm the weak, the base expedients of man. What says the Decalogue? Honor thy father. What says the penal law? Take away his estate. Again, says the Decalogue, do not steal. The law, on the contrary, proclaims, you may rob a Catholic. On the downfall of Bonaparte, from the speech of May 25th, 1815, the French government is war. It is a statocracy, elective, aggressive, and predatory. Her armies live to fight and fight to live. Their constitution is essentially war, and the object of that war, the conquest of Europe. What such a person as Bonaparte at the head of such a constitution will do, you may judge by what he has done. And first he took possession of a greater part of Europe. He made his son king of Rome. He made his son-in-law viceroy of Italy. He made his brother king of Holland. He made his brother-in-law king of Naples. He imprisoned the king of Spain. He banished the regent of Portugal and formed his plan to take possession of the crown of England. England had checked his designs. Her trident had stirred up his empire from its foundation. He complained of her tyranny at sea, but it was her power at sea which arrested his tyranny on land. The navy of England saved Europe. Knowing this, he knew the conquest of England became necessary for the accomplishment of the conquest of Europe and the destruction of her marine necessary for the conquest of England. Accordingly, besides raising an army of 60,000 men for the invasion of England, he applied himself to the destruction of her commerce, the foundation of her naval power. In pursuit of this object and on his plan of a Western empire, he conceived and in part executed the design of consigning to plunder and destruction the vast regions of Russia. He quits the genial clime of the temperate zone. He bursts through the narrow limits of an immense empire. He abandons comfort and security, and he hurries to the pole to hazard them all, and with them the companions of his victories and the fame and fruits of his crimes and his talents, on speculation of leaving in Europe throughout the whole of its extent no one free or independent nation. To oppose this huge conception of mischief and despotism, the great potentate of the North, from his gloomy recesses, advances to defend himself against the veracity of ambition amid the sterility of his empire. Ambition is omnivorous. It feasts on famine and sheds tons of blood, that it may starve in ice in order to commit a robbery on desolation. The power of the North, I say, joins another prince, whom Bonaparte had deprived of almost the whole of his authority, the King of Prussia, and then another potentate, whom Bonaparte had deprived of the principal part of his dominions, the Emperor of Austria. These three powers, physical causes, final justice, the influence of your victories in Spain and Portugal, and the spirit given to Europe by the achievements and renown of your great commander, the Duke of Wellington, together with the precipitation of his own ambition, combined to accomplish his destruction. Bonaparte is conquered. He who said, I will be like the Most High. He who smote the nations with a continual stroke. This short-lived son of the morning, Lucifer, falls, and the earth is at rest. The phantom of royalty passes on to nothing, and the three kings to the gates of Paris, there they stand, the late victims of his ambition, and now the disposers of his destiny and the masters of his empire. Without provocation, he had gone to their countries with fire and sword. With the greatest provocation, they came to his country with life and liberty. They do an act unparalleled in the annals of history, such as nor envy, nor time, nor malice, nor prejudice, nor ingratitude can efface. They give to his subjects liberty, and to himself life and royalty. This is greater than conquest. The present race must confess their virtues, and ages to come must crown their monuments, 
and place them above heroes and kings in glory everlasting. Do you wish to confirm this military tyranny in the heart of Europe? A tyranny founded on the triumph of the army over the principles of civil government, tending to universalize throughout Europe the domination of the sword and to reduce to paper and parchment Magna Carta and all our civil constitutions. An experiment such as no country ever made and no good country would ever permit to relax the moral and religious influences to set heaven and earth adrift from one another and make God Almighty a tolerated alien in his own creation an insurrectionary hope to every bad man in the community, and a frightful lesson to profit and power, vested in those who have pandered their allegiance from king to emperor, and now found their pretensions to domination on the merit of breaking their oaths and deposing their sovereign. Should you do anything so monstrous as to leave your allies in order to confirm such a system, should you forget your name, forget your ancestors, and the inheritance they have left you of morality and renown? Should you astonish Europe by quitting your allies to render immortal such a composition? Would not the nations exclaim? You have very providently watched over our interest, and very generously have you contributed to our service. And do you falter now? In vain have you stopped in your own person the flying fortunes of Europe, in vain have you taken the eagle of Napoleon and snatched invincibility from his standard. If now, when confederated Europe is ready to march, you take the lead in the desertion and preach the penitence of Bonaparte and the poverty of England. End of section 34《Section 35 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16, by Various. Selected Poems by Thomas Gray Thomas Gray, 1716-1771 to 1771, By George Parsons Lathrop The fame of Thomas Gray is unique among English poets in that although worldwide and luminous it springs from a single poem, a flawless masterpiece, the elegy written in a country churchyard. This is the one production by which he is known to the great mass of readers and will continue to be known to coming generations. Yet in his own time his other poems were important factors in establishing the high repute accorded to him then and still maintained in the esteem of critics. Nevertheless, living to be nearly fifty-five and giving himself exclusively to letters, the whole of the work that he left behind him amounted only to some fourteen hundred lines. His value to literature and to posterity, therefore, is to be measured not by the quantity of his literary contributions, or by any special variety in their scope, but by a certain wholesome and independent influence which he exerted upon the language of poetry, and by a rare quality of intense, yet seemingly calm and almost repressed genius, which no one among his commentators has been able to define clearly. The most comprehensive thing ever written about him, wise, just, witty, yet sympathetic and penetrating, is the essay by James Russell Lowell in his final volume of criticism. It is the rarest thing, says Lowell, to find genius and dilettantism united in the same person, as for a time they were in Goethe. For genius implies always a certain fanaticism of temperament, which, if sometimes it seem fitful, is yet capable of intense energy on occasion, while the main characteristic of the dilettante is that sort of impartiality which springs from inertia of mind, admirable for observation, incapable of turning it to practical account. Yet we have, I think, an example of this rare combination of qualities in gray and it accounts both for the kind of excellence to which he attained and for the way in which he disappointed expectation. 
he is especially interesting as an artist in words and phrases a literary type far less common among writers of english than it is in france or italy where perhaps the traditions of latin culture were never wholly lost when so many have written so much we shall the more readily pardon the man who has written too little or just enough he was born in london december twenty sixth seventeen sixteen the son of a money scrivener who had dissipated most of his inherited property but was skilled in music and perhaps transmitted to the son that musical element which gives beauty and strength to his poetry gray's mother was a woman of character who with his aunt set up an india warehouse and supported herself also sending the young man to st peter's college cambridge after his studies at eton leaving college without a degree he travelled on the continent of europe with horace walpole in seventeen thirty nine then returned to cambridge and passed the remainder of his life in the university as a bachelor of civil law nominally not practising but devoting himself to study and to excursions through rural england he had a profound and passionate love for nature a kind of religious exaltation in the contemplation of it and in mountain worship which was at variance with the prevailing eighteenth-century literary mood and prefigured the feeling of wordsworth his mother having retired to stoke poaches buckinghamshire he often made visits there and the churchyard of his deathless elegy is generally believed to be that of the parish church at stoke poaches it was here that he was laid to rest in the same tomb with his mother and his aunt after his death july twenty fourth seventeen seventy one the elegy was finished in seventeen forty nine he had begun writing it seven years before this has sometimes been alluded to as an instance in point of Horace's advice that a poem should be matured for seven years. The length of time given to the elegy, however, may be accounted for partly by Gray's dilatory habits of writing, and partly by the parallel of Tennyson's long delay in perfecting the utterance of his meditations on the death of his friend Hallam through In Memoriam. Gray's dearest friend, Richard West, died in 1742 and it was apparently under the stress of that sorrow that he began the elegy which was completed only in seventeen forty nine two years later it was published it won the popular heart immediately and passed through four editions in the first twelvemonth of gray's other poems those which have left the deepest impression are his ode on a distant prospect of eton college the progress of poesy and the bard the last two are somewhat pindaric in style but also suggests the influence of the italian canzone in the eton college ode his first published piece occurs the phrase since grown proverbial where ignorance is bliss tis folly to be wise it is a curious fact that while most readers know gray only as the author of the elegy every one is familiar with certain lines coined by him but unaware of their source for instance in the progress of poesy he speaks of the unconquerable mind and freedom solely flame it is in the same place that he describes milton as blasted with excess of light and alluding to dryden evolves the image of thoughts that breathe and words that burn his too in the bard is the now well-known line youth on the prow and pleasure at the helm many of his finest expressions are in part derived from classic or other poets but he showed undeniable genius in his adaptation transformation or new creation from these suggestive passages gray was small and delicate in person handsome and refined fond of fashionable dress and preferred to be known as a gentleman rather than a poet he was very reticent somewhat melancholy and an invalid a man also of vast erudition being learned not only in literature but in botany zoology antiquities architecture art history and philosophy as well he enjoyed the distinction of refusing the post of poet laureate after the death of kipper on the other hand he coveted the place of professor of modern literature and languages at cambridge university to which he was appointed in seventeen sixty nine but he never performed any of the duties of his professorship beyond that of drawing the salary he brought forth nothing in the special kinds of knowledge which he had acquired in such large measure and the actual ideas conveyed in his poetry were not original but savoured rather of the commonplace 
Lowell says of elegy, that it won its popularity not through any originality of thought, but far more through originality of sound. There must, however, be some deeper reason than this for the grasp which it has upon the minds and hearts of all classes. Two elements of power and popularity it certainly possessed in the highest degree. One is the singular simplicity of its language, a result of consummate art, which makes it understandable to everybody. The other is the depth and the sincerity of the emotion with which it imbues thoughts, sentiments, and reflections that are common to the whole of mankind. The very unproductiveness of Gray's mind in other directions probably helped this one product. The quintessence of all his learning, his perceptive faculty, and his meditations was infused into the life-blood of this immortal poem. Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard the curfew tolls the knell of parting day. The lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lea. The plowman homeward plods his weary way, And leaves the world to darkness and to me. Now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight, And all the air a solemn stillness holds, Save where the beetle wheels his droning flight, And drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds. Save that from yonder ivy mantled tower the moping owl does to the moon complain of such as wandering near her secret bower molest her ancient solitary reign beneath those rugged elms the yew trees shade where heaves the turf in many a mouldering heap each in his narrow cell for ever laid the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep the breezy call of incense breathing morn the swallow twittering from the straw-built shed the cock's shrill clarion or the echoing horn no more shall rouse them from their lowly bed for them no more the blazing hearth shall burn or busy housewife ply her evening care no children run to lisp their sire's return or climb his knees the envied kiss to share oft did the harvest to their sickle yield their furrow oft the stubborn glebe has broke how jocund did they drive their team afield! How bowed the woods beneath their sturdy stroke! Let not ambition mock their useful toil, Their homely joys, and destiny obscure, Nor grandeur hear with a disdainful smile The short and simple annals of the poor. The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, And all that beauty, all that wealth e'er gave, Await alike the inevitable hour, the paths of glory lead but to the grave. Nor you, ye proud, impute to these the fault, If memory o'er their tomb no trophies raise, Where through the long-drawn aisle and fretted vault The pealing anthem swells the note of praise. Can storied urn or animated bust Back to its mansion call the fleeting breath? Can honor's voice provoke the silent dust, Or flattery soothe the dull, cold ear of death? Perhaps in this neglected spot is laid some heart once pregnant with celestial fire, hands that the rod of empire might have swayed, or waked to ecstasy the living lyre. But knowledge to their eyes her ample page, rich with the spoils of time, did ne'er unroll. Chill penury repressed their noble rage, and froze the genial current of the soul. Full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air some village hampton that with dauntless breast the little tyrant of his fields withstood some mute inglorious milton here may rest some cromwell guiltless of his country's blood the applause of listening sentence to command the threats of pain and ruin to despise to scatter plenty o'er a smiling land, And read their history in a nation's eyes. Their lot forbade, nor circumscribed alone Their growing virtues, but their crimes confined. Forbade to wade through slaughter to a throne, And shut the gates of mercy on mankind. The struggling pangs of conscious truth to hide, To quench the blushes of ingenuous shame, or heap the shrine of luxury and pride with incense kindled at the muse's flame the thoughtless world to majesty may bow exalt the brave and idolize success 
but more to innocence their safety owe than power and genius e'er conspired to bless hark how the sacred calm that broods around bids every fierce tumultuous passion cease in still small accents whispering from the ground a grateful earnest of eternal peace far from the maddening crowd's ignoble strife their sober wishes never learned to stray along the cool sequestered vale of life they kept the noiseless tenor of their way yet even these bones from insult to protect some frail memorial still erected nigh with uncouth rhymes and shapeless sculpture decked implores the passing tribute of a sigh their names their years spelt by the unlettered muse the place of fame and elegy supply and many a holy text around she strews that teach the rustic moralist to die for who to dumb forgetfulness a prey this pleasing anxious being e'er resigned left the warm precincts of the cheerful day nor cast one longing lingering look behind on some fond breast the parting soul relies some pious drops the closing eye requires e'en from the tomb the voice of nature cries e'en in our ashes live their wanted fires for thee who mindful of the unhonored dead dost in these lines their artless tale relate if chance by lonely contemplation led some kindred spirit shall inquire thy fate haply some hoary-headed swain may say oft have we seen him at the peep of dawn brushing with hasty steps the dews away to meet the sun upon the upland lawn there at the foot of yonder nodding beech that wreathes its old fantastic roots so high his listless length at noontide would he stretch and pour upon the brook that babbles by hard by yon wood now smiling as in scorn muttering his wayward fancies he would rove now drooping woeful wan like one forlorn or crazed with care are crossed in hopeless love one morn i missed him on the customed hill along the heath and near his favorite tree another came nor yet beside the rill nor up the lawn nor at the wood was he the next with dirges due in sad array slow through the churchway path we saw him borne approach and read for thou canst read the lay graved on the stone beneath yon aged thorn there scattered off the earliest of the year by hands unseen are showers of violets found the redbreast loves to build and warble there and little footsteps lightly print the ground the epitaph here rests his head upon the lap of earth a youth to fortune and to fame unknown fair science frowned not on his humble birth and melancholy marked him for her own large was his bounty and his soul sincere heaven did recompense as largely sinned he gave to misery all he had a tear he gained from heaven twas all he wished a friend no farther seek his merits to disclose or draw his frailties from their dread abode there they alike in trembling hope repose the bosom of his father and his god ode on the spring lo where the rosy bosomed hours fair venus train appear disclose the long expecting flowers and wake the purple year the attic warbler pours her throat responsive to the cuckoo's note the untaught harmony of spring while whispering pleasures as they fly cool zephyrs through the clear blue sky their gathered fragrance fling where'er the oak's thick branches stretch a broader browner shade where the rude and moss-grown beech or canopies the glade beside some water's rushy brink with me the muse shall sit and think at ease reclined in rustic state how vain the ardour of the crowd how low how little are the proud how indigent the great still is the toiling hand of care the panting herds repose yet hark how through the peopled air the busy murmur glows the insect youth are on the wing eager to taste the honeyed spring and float amid the liquid noon some lightly o'er the current skim some show their gaily gilded trim quick glancing to the sun to contemplation's sober eyes such is the race of man and they that creep 
and they that fly shall end where they began alike the busy and the gay but flutter through life's little day in fortune's varying colors dressed brushed by the hand of rough mischance or chilled by age their airy dance they leave in dust to rest methinks i hear in accents low the sportive kind reply poor moralist and what art thou a solitary fly thy joys no glittering female meets no hive hast thou of hoarded sweets no painted plumage to display or hasty wings thy youth is flown thy sun is set thy spring is gone we frolic while tis may on a distant prospect of eton college ye distant spires ye antique towers that crown the watery glade where grateful science still adores her henry's holy shade and ye that from the stately brow of windsor's heights the expanse below of grove of lawn of mead survey whose turf whose shade whose flowers among wanders the hoary thames along his silver winding way ah happy hills all pleasing shade all fields beloved in vain where once my careless childhood strayed a stranger yet to pain i feel the gales that from ye blow a momentary bliss bestow as waving fresh their gladsome wing my weary soul they seem to soothe and redolent of joy and youth to breathe a second spring say father thames for thou hast seen full many a sprightly race disporting on thy margent green the paths of pleasure trace who foremost now delight to cleave with pliant arm thy glassy wave the captive linnet which enthrall what idle progeny succeed to chase the rolling circle's speed or urge the flying ball while some on earnest business bent their murmuring labors ply against graver hours that bring constraint to sweeten liberty some bold adventurers disdain the limits of their little reign and unknown regions dare descry still as they run they look behind they hear a voice in every wind and snatch a fearful joy gay hope is theirs by fancy fed less pleasing when possessed the tear forgot as soon as shed the sunshine of the breast theirs buxom health of rosy hue wild wit invention ever new and lively cheer of vigour born the thoughtless day the easy night the spirits pure the slumber's light that fly the approach of morn alas regardless of their doom the little victims play no sense have they of ills to come nor care beyond to-day yet see how all around them wait the ministers of human fate and black misfortune's baleful train ah show them where in ambush stand to seize their prey the murtherous band ah tell them they are men these shall the fury passions tear the vultures of the mind disdainful anger pallid fear and shame that skulks behind or pining love shall waste their youth or jealousy with rankling tooth that inly gnaws the secret heart an envy wan and faded care grim visage comfortless despair and sorrow's piercing dart ambition this shall tempt to rise then whirl the wretch from high to bitter scorn a sacrifice and grinning infamy the stings of falsehood those shall try and hard unkindnesses altered eye that mocks the tear it forced to flow and keen remorse with blood defiled and moody madness laughing wild amid severest woe lo in the vale of years beneath a grisly troop are seen the painful family of death more hideous than their queen this racks the joints this fires the veins that every labouring sinew strains those in the deeper vitals rage lo poverty to fill the band that numbs the soul with icy hand and slow consuming age to each his sufferings all are men condemned alike to groan the tender for another's pain the unfeeling for his own yet ah why should they know their fate since sorrow never comes too late and happiness too swiftly flies thought would destroy their paradise no more where ignorance is bliss tis folly to be wise the bard a pindaric ode 
Ruin seize thee, ruthless king, confusion on thy banners wait. Though fanned by conquest's crimson wing, they mock the air with idle state. Helm the hauberk's twisted mail, nor e'en thy virtues tyrant shall avail to save thy secret soul from nightly fears. From Cambria's curse, from Cambria's tears, such were the sounds that o'er the crested pride of the first Edward scattered wild dismay, as down the steep of Snowdon's shaggy side he wound with toilsome march his long array. Stout Gloucester stood aghast in speechless trance. To arms, cried Mortimer, and couched his quivering lance. On a rock whose haughty brow frowns o'er the Conway's foaming flood, robed in the sable garb of woad, with haggard eyes the poet stood. Loose his beard and hoary hair streamed like a meteor to the troubled air, and with a master's hand and prophet's fire struck the deep sorrows of his lyre. Hark how each giant oak and desert cave sighs to the torrent's awful voice beneath. O'er thee, O king, their hundred arms they wave, Revenge on thee, and hoarser murmurs breathe. Vocal no more since Cambria's fatal day, To high-born Hoel's harp, or soft Llewellyn's lay. Cold is Cadwallo's tongue, that hushed the stormy main. Brave Urian sleeps upon his craggy bed. Mountains ye mourn in vain. Modred, whose magic song made huge Plinlimon bow his cloud-topped head. On dreary Arvon's shore they lie, smeared with gore and ghastly pale. Far, far aloof the affrighted ravens sail. The famished eagle screams and passes by. Dear lost companions of my tuneful art, Dear is the light that visits these sad eyes. Dear is the ruddy drops that warm my heart. Ye died amidst your dying country's cries. No more I weep they do not sleep on yonder cliffs a grisly band i see them sit they linger yet avengers of their native land with me in dreadful harmony they join and weave with bloody hands the tissue of thy line weave the warp and weave the woof the winding sheet of edward's race give ample room and verge enough the characters of hell to trace mark the year and mark the night when Severn shall re-echo with affright, the shrieks of death through Barclay's roof that ring, shrieks of an agonizing king. She-wolf of France, with unrelenting fangs, that tears the bowels of thy mangled mate, from thee be born, who o'er thy country hangs the scourge of heaven. What terrors round him wait! Amazement in his van, with flight combined, and sorrow's faded form, and solitude, behind mighty victor mighty lord lo on his funeral couch he lies no pitying heart no eye afford a tear to grace his obsequies is the sable warrior fled thy son is gone he rests among the dead the swarm that in thy noontide beam were born gone to salute the rising morn Fair laughs the morn, and soft the zephyr blows, While proudly riding o'er the azure realm, In gallant trim, the gilded vessel goes. Youth on the prow, and pleasure at the helm, Regardless of the sweeping whirlwind sway, That hushed in grim repose expects his evening prey. Fill high the sparkling bowl, the rich repast prepare, Reft of a crown, he yet may share the feast. Close by the regal chair fell thirst and famine's scowl, a baleful smile upon their baffled guest. Heard ye the din of battle bray, lance to lance and horse to horse. Long years of havoc urged their destined course, and through the kindred squadrons mow their way. Ye towers of Julius, London's lasting shame, with many a foul and midnight murder fed, revere his consort's faith his father's fame, and spare the meek usurper's holy head. Above, below, the rose of snow, twined with her blushing foe, we spread. The bristled boar, in infant gore, wallows beneath the thorny shade. Now, brothers, bending o'er the accursed loom, stamp we our vengeance deep, and ratify his doom. 
Edward Lowe, to sudden fate, weave we the woof, the thread is spun, half of thy heart we consecrate, the web is wove, the work is done. Stay, O oh stay, nor thus forlorn leave me unblessed, unpitied here to mourn. In yon bright track that fires the western skies, they melt, they vanish from my eyes. But oh, what solemn scenes on Snowdon's height, descending slow, their glittering skirts unroll. Visions of glory spare my aching sight. Ye unborn ages, crowd not on my soul. No more our long-lost Arthur we be well. All hail, ye genuine kings, Britannia's issue hail. Girt with many a barren bold, sublime their starry fronts they rear, and gorgeous dames and statesmen old in bearded majesty appear, in the midst of form divine. Her eye proclaims her of the Britain line, her lion port, her awe commanding face, a tempered sweet to virgin grace. What strings symphonious tremble in the air, what strains of vocal transport round her play. Here from the grave, great Taliesin, here. They breathe a soul to animate thy clay. Bright rapture calls, and soaring as she sings, Waves in the eye of heaven her many-colored wings. The verse adorn again fierce war and faithful love, And truth severe by fairy fiction dressed, In busked measures move pale grief and pleasing pain. With horror, tyrant of the throbbing breast, A voice as of the cherub choir gales from blooming eden bare and distant warblings lessen on my ear that lost in long futurity expire fond and pious man thinkest thou yon sanguine cloud raised by thy breath has quenched the orb of day to-morrow he repairs the golden flood and warms the nations with redoubled ray enough for me with joy i see the different doom our fates assign be thine despair and sceptred care to triumph and to die are mine he spoke and headlong from the mountain's height deep in the roaring tide he plunged to endless night end of section thirty five Section 36 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16, by Various. The Greek Anthology, by Talcott Williams. The greater monuments of Greece all men know, the incomparable peaks of the chain, and the chain lasted seventeen hundred years, nor ever sang to the dead level about. The steadfast sight of these great Greek originals warps and dwarfs our conception of Greek life. We behold the Parthenon, we forget that each village shrine had its sense of proportion and subtle curve. The Venus of Milos we remember, and the victory is poised forever on its cliff. But Tanagra figurines tell us much, and reveal more, of Greek life. Nor is it otherwise in letters. The great names all know. For a brief span they stood close together, and the father who heard Aeschylus might have told his experience to his long-lived son who read Aristotle, while between the two stood all the greatest genius that makes Greece Greek, save only Homer. So brief was the noonday, and it is at high noon, and high noon only, that men have agreed to take the sun, but this uplift was gained in the ascent of nigh two hundred years from the first written Greek literature that still lives. The descent to the last of the Greek verse which still remained poetry ran through thirteen centuries. Over all this prodigious span of 1,500 years stretches the Greek anthology, a collection of 4,063 short Greek poems, two to eight lines long for the most part, collected and recollected through more than a thousand years. The first of these poets, Mimnermus, was a contemporary of Jeremiah and dwelt in cities that shuddered over tidings of Babylonian invasion. 
the last, Cometus, was the contemporary of Edward the Confessor, the dreaded Seljuk and Turk. As the epic impulse faded and before a Greek genius for tragedy rose, the same race and dialect which had given epic narrative the proud full verse that filled like a sail to zephyr and to storm alike, devised the elegiac couplet with its opening even flow, its swifter rush in the second line, and its abrupt pause, it was a medium in which not narrative but man spoke, whether personal in passion, or impersonal in the dedication of a statue, or in epitaph. This verse had conventions as rigorous and restrained as the sonnet, and was briefer. It served as well for the epitaph of Thermopylae as for the cradle beer of a child, dead newborn and lent itself as gracefully to the gift of a bunch of roses as it swelled with some sonorous blast of patriotism. It could sharpen to a jibe or sink to a wail at untoward fate. Through a period twice as long as the life of English letters, these short poems set forth the vision of life, the ways and works of men, the love and death of mortals. These lines of weight, of moment, always of grace and often of inspiration, stood on milestones. They graced the base of statues, they were inscribed on tombs, they stood over doorways, they were painted on vases. The rustic shrines held them, and on the front of the great temple they were born. In this form, friend wrote to friend and lover to lover. Four or five of the best expressed the emotion of the passing Greek traveler at the statue of Memnon on the Nile. The quality of verse that fills the in album today we all know, but Greek life was so compact of form and thought that even this unknown traveler's verse, scrawled with the stylus, still thrills, still rings, as the statue still sounds its ancient note. In this long succession of short poems is delineated the Greek character, not of Athens, but of the whole circle of the Mediterranean. The sphered life of the race is in its subjects. Each great Greek victory has its epigrams. In them, statues have an immortal life denied to marble and to bronze. The critical admiration of the Hellene for his great men of letters stands recorded here, his early love for the heroes of his brief-lived freedom, and his sedulous flattery of the Roman lords of his slavery. Here, too, is his domestic life, its joy and its sorrow. In this epigram, the maid dedicates her dolls to Artemis, and in that, the mother, mother and priestess both, lays down a life overflowing in good deeds and fruited with honorable offspring. The splendid side of Greek life is painted elsewhere. Here is its homely simplicity. The fisher again spreads his nets and the sailor his peak latine sail. The hunter sets his snares and tracks his game in the light snow. The caged partridge stretches its weary wings in its cage, and the cat has for it a modern appetite. Men jibe and jest. They see how hollow life is and also how truth rings true. Love is here, sacred and revered, its forms pure and holy, and not less, that foul pool decked with beauty in which Greek manhood lost its masculine virtue. Half a century before Christ, when Greek life overspread the eastern Mediterranean, and in every marketplace Greek was the tongue of trade, of learning, and of gentle breeding, Greek letters grew conscious of its own riches. For six centuries and more, or as long as separates us from Chaucer, men had been writing these brief epigrams. The first had their brevity of Simonides, the next Alexandrian luxuriance. Many were carved by those who wrote much, more by those who composed but two or three. In Syrian Gadara there dwelt a Greek, Meliager, whose poetry is a very flower of fervent Greek verse. Yet so near did he live to the great change which was to overturn the gods he loved and substitute morality for beauty as the mainspring of life, that some who knew him must also, a brief span of years later, have known Jesus the Christ. Meliager was the first who gathered Greek epigrams in an anthology, 
prefacing it with such apt critical utterance as has been the despair of all critics called sense to weigh verse in ruder scales and with a poise less perfect. He had the wide round of the best of Greek to pick from, and he chose with unerring taste. To his collection, Philippus of Thessalonica, working when Paul was preaching in Jason's house, added the work of the Roman period, the fourth development of the epigram. Other collections between have perished, one in the third or Byzantine period, in which this verse had a renaissance under Justinian. In the 10th century, a Byzantine scholar, Constantino Cephalus, rearranged his predecessor's collections, Meliagers included, and brought together the largest number which has come down to us. The collection is known today as the Palatine Anthology, from the library which long owned it. His work was in the last flare of life in the Lower Empire, when Greek heroism, for the last time, stemmed the Moslem tide and gave Eastern Europe breathing space. When his successor, Maximus Planudes of the century of Petrarch, monk, diplomat, theologian, and phrase-maker, addressed himself to the last collection made, the shadow of New Italy lay over Greek life, and the Galilean had recast the minds of men. He excluded much that Greeks, from Meliager to Cephalus, had freely admitted, and which modern lovers of the anthology would be willing to see left out of all copies but their own. The collection of Planudes long remained alone known, first edition Florence, 1594. That of Cephalus survived in a single manuscript of buried fortune, seen in 1606 by Salmatius at 18, happy boy and happy manuscript, lost to learning for a century and a half in the Vatican, published by Bronck, 1776, and finally edited by Frederick Jacobs, 1794 to 1803, five volumes of text and three of comment, usually bound in eight. The text has been republished by Toschnitz, and the whole work has its most convenient and familiar form for scholars in the edition of both the collections of Planudes and Cephalus, with epigrams from all other sources prepared by Frederick Dubner for Didot's Bibliotheca Scriptorum Grecorum, 1864-1872, three volumes. The anthology as a whole has no adequate English translation. About one-third of the poems have a prose translation by George Burgess in the Greek Anthology, 1832, of Bone series, with versions in verse by many hands. The first English translation of selections appeared anonymously, 1791. Others have succeeded. Robert Bland and John Herman Merivale, 1806. Robert Bland, 1813. Richard Garnet, 1864. Sir Edwin Arnold, 1869. John Addington Simmons, 1873. J.W. Mackale, 1890, Lilia Cabot Perry, 1891, a collection of selected translations edited by Graham R. Thompson was published in 1889. Of these partial versions, the only one which approaches the incommunicable charm of the original is Mr. Mackail's, an incomparable translation. His versions are freely used in the selections which follow. All the metrical versions, except those by Mrs. Perry, are from Miss Thompson's collection. But no translation equals the sanity, the brevity, the clarity of the Greek original, qualities which have made these epigrams consummate models of style to the modern world. In all the round of literature, the only exact analog of the Greek epigram is a Japanese ode with its 30 syllables, its single idea, and its constant use of all classes as a universal medium of familiar poetic expression. Of like nature, used alike for epigraph, epitaph, and familiar personal expression, is the rhymed Arabic makada, brief poems written in one form, for 1800 years and still written. Talcott Williams End of section 36, read by Bryce Cries, Youngstown, USA.
Section 37 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 16, by Various. Selected Epigrams from the Greek Anthology. On the Athenian dead at Plataea, Simonides, 556-467 to B.C. If to die nobly is the chief part of excellence, to us out of all men fortune gave this lot. For hasting to set a crown of freedom on Greece, we lie possessed of praise that grows not old. Translation of J. W. Mackail On the Lacedaemonian dead at Plataea, Simonides. These men, having set a crown of imperishable glory on their own land, were folded in the dark clouds of death. Yet being dead they have not died, since from on high their excellence raises them gloriously out of the house of Hades. Translation of J. W. Mackail. On a sleeping satyr, Plato, 429 to 347 B.C. This satyr, Theodorus, engraved not, but laid to rest. Your touch will wake him. The silver is asleep. Translation of J. W. Mackail A Poet's Epitaph Simeus of Thebes, 405 B.C. Quietly o'er the tomb of Sophocles, Quietly ivy creep with tendrils green, And roses ope your petals everywhere, while dewy shoots of grapevine peep between, upon the wise and honeyed poet's grave, whom muse and grace their richest treasures gave. Translation of J. W. Mackail Worship in Spring Theotetus, 4th century B.C. Now at her fruitful birthtide the fair green field flowers out in blowing roses, now on the boughs of the colonnaded cypresses, the cicala, mad with music, lulls the binder of sheaves, and the careful mother swallow, having finished houses under the eaves, gives harborage to her brood in the mud-plastered cells. And the sea slumbers, with zephyr-wooing calm spread clear over the broad ship-tracks, not breaking in squalls on the stem-posts, not vomiting foam upon the beaches. O sailor, burned by the altars the glistening round of a mullet, or a cuttlefish, or a vocal scarus, to Priapus, ruler of ocean and giver of anchorage, and so go fearlessly on thy seafaring to the bounds of the Ionian Sea. Translation by J. W. Mackail Spring on the Coast Leonotus of Tarentum, 3rd century B.C. Now is the season of sailing, for already the chattering swallow has come, and the gracious west wind, the meadow's flower, and the sea, tossed up with waves and rough blasts, has sunk to silence. Weigh thine anchors and unloose thine hawsers, O mariner, and sail with all thy canvas set. This I, Priapus of the harbor, bid thee, O man, that thou mayest set forth to all thy trafficking. Translation of J. W. Mackail A Young Hero's Epitaph Dioscorides, 3rd century B.C. Home to Patana comes Thrasybulus, lifeless on his shield, seven Argive wounds before. His bleeding boy, the father Tinicus, lays on the pyre to say, Let your wounds weep. Tearless I bury you, my boy, mine and my country's. Translation of Talca Williams Love, Posidipus, 3rd century B.C. Jar of Athens, drip the dewy juice of wine, drip, let the feast to which all bring their share be wetted as with dew, be silenced the swan sage Zeno and the muse of Cleanthes, and let bitter sweet love be our concern. Translation of J. W. Mackail Sorrow's Barren Grave Heraclitus, 3rd century B.C. 
Keep off, keep off thy hand, O husbandman, nor through this grave's calm dust thy plowshare drive. These very sods have once been mourned upon, and on such ground no crop will ever thrive. Nor corn spring up with green and feathery ears from earth that has been watered by such tears. Translation of Alma Stretel To a Coy Maiden As Copleides, 286 B.C. Believe me, love, it is not good to hoard a mortal maidenhood. In Hades thou wilt never find maiden a lover to thy mind. Loves for the living, presently ashes and dust, and death are we. Translation of Andrew Lang The Emptied Quiver Minisalcus, 2nd century B.C. This bending bow and the emptied quiver, Prometheus hangs as a gift to thee, Phoebus. The swift shafts men's hearts hold, whom they call to death in the battle's rout. Translation of Talcott Williams the Tale of Troy, Alpheus, 1st century B.C. Still we hear the wail of Andromache, still we see all Troy toppling from her foundations, and the battling Ajax and Hector, bound to the horses, dragged under the city's crown of towers, through the muse of Meonides, the poet with whom no country adorns herself as her own, but the zones of both worlds. Translation of J. W. MacHale Heaven hath its stars. Marcus Argentarius, 1st century B.C. Feasting, I watch with westward-looking eye the flashing constellation's pageantry, solemn and splendid. Then anon I wreathe my hair, and warbling to my harp I breathe my full heart forth, and know the heavens look down pleased, for they also have their lyre and crown. Translation of Richard Garnett Pan of the Sea Cliff Archaeus, 1st century B.C. Me, Pan, the fisherman placed upon this holy cliff, Pan of the seashore, the watcher here over the fair anchorages of the harbor, and I take care now of the baskets and again of the trawlers off the shore. But sail thou by, O stranger, and in requital of this good service of theirs, I will send behind thee a gentle south wind. Translation of J. W. MacHale Anacreon's Grave Antipater of Sidon, 1st century B.C. O stranger, who passeth by the humble tomb of Anacreon, if thou hast had aught of good from my books, pour libation on my ashes, Pour libation of the jocund grape, that my bones may rejoice, wetted with wine, so I, who was ever deep in the wine-steep revels of Dionysus, I, who was bred among drinking tunes, shall not even, when dead, endure without Bacchus this place to which the generation of mortals must come. Translation of J. W. MacHale Rest at Noon Meliager First century B.C. Voiceful cricket, drunken with drops of dew, thou playest thy rustic music that murmurs in the solitude, and perched on the leaf edges shrillest thy lyre tune with serrated legs and swart skin. But, my dear, utter a new song for the tree nymph's delight, and make thy harp notes echo to pans, that, escaping love, I may seek out sleep at noon, here, lying under the shady plain. Translation of J. W. MacHale In the spring a young man's fancy, Meliager. Now the white iris blossoms, and the rain-loving Narcissus, and now again the lily, the mountain roaming, blows. Now, too, the flower of lovers, the crown of all the springtime, Xenophila the winsome, doth blossoms with the rose. O meadows, wherefore vainly in your radiant garlands laugh ye, since fairer is a maiden than any flower that grows. Translation by Alma Stretel Meliager's Own Epitaph Meliager Tread softly, O stranger, for here an old man sleeps among the holy dead, lulled in the slumber due to all. 
Meleager, son of Eucrates, who united love of the sweet tears and the muses with the joyous graces, whom God begotten Tyre brought to manhood, and the sacred land of Gadara, but lovely Kos nursed in old age among the Meropes. But if thou art a Syrian, say Salam, and if a Phoenician, Nadios, and if a Greek, Hail, they are the same. Translation of J. W. Mackail. Epilogue. Philodemus, 60 B.C. I was in love once, who has not been. I have rebelled, who is uninitiated in rebels. Nay, I was mad, at whose prompting but a god's. Let them go, for now the silver hair is fast replacing the black, a messenger of wisdom that comes with age. We too played when the time of playing was, and now that it is no longer, we will turn to worthier thoughts. Translation of J. W. Mackail Doctor and Divinity Nacarchus Marcus the doctor called yesterday on the marble Zeus. Though marble and though Zeus, his funeral is today. Translation of J. W. Mackail Love's Immortality Strato, 1st century A.D. Who may know if a loved one passes the prime while ever with him and never left alone? Who may not satisfy today who satisfied yesterday? And if he satisfy, what should befall him not to satisfy tomorrow? Translation of J.W. Mackail As the flowers of the field, Strato If thou boast in thy beauty, know that the rose too blooms, but quickly being withered, is cast on the dunghill. For blossom and beauty have the same time allotted to them, and both together envious time withers away. Translation of J.W. Mackail Summer Sailing Antiphilus, 1st century A.D. Mine be a mattress on the poop, and the awnings over it, sounding with the blows of the spray, and the fire forcing its way out of the hearthstones, and a pot upon them with empty turmoil of bubbles, and let me see the boy dressing the meat, and my table be a ship's plank covered with a cloth, and a game of pitch and toss, and the boatswain's whistle. The other day I had such fortune, for I love common life. Translation of J. W. Mackail The Great Mysteries Crenagoras, 1st century A.D. Though thy life be fixed in one seat, and thou sailest not the sea, nor treadest the roads on dry land, yet by all means go to Attica, that thou mayest see those great knights of the worship of Demeter, whereby thou shalt possess thy soul without care among the living, and lighter when thou must go to the place that awaiteth all. Translation of J. W. Mackail To Priapus of the Shore Maecius, Roman Period Priapus of the seashore, the trawlers lay before thee these gifts by the grace of thine aid from the promontory, having imprisoned a tunny shoal in their nets of spun hemp in the green sea entrances, a beechen cup and a rude stool of heath, and a glass cup holding wine, that thou mayest rest thy foot, weary and cramped with dancing, while thou chasest away the dry thirst. Translation of J. W. Mackail The Common Lot Ammianus, 2nd century A.D. Though thou pass beyond the landmarks, even to the pillars of Heracles, the share of earth that is equal to all men awaits thee, and thou shalt lie even as Iris, having nothing more than thine obelisk moldering into a land that at last is not thine. Translation of J. W. Mackail Tomorrow and Tomorrow Macedonius, 3rd century A.D. Tomorrow I will look on thee, but that never comes for us, while the accustomed putting off ever grows and grows. This is all thy grace to my longing, and to others thou bearest other gifts, despising my faithful service. I will see thee at evening, and what is the evening of a woman's life? Old age full of a million wrinkles. Translation of J. W. Mackail. 
the palace garden, Arabius 527 to 567 AD. I am filled with waters and gardens and groves and vineyards and the joyousness of the bordering sea, and fisherman and farmer from different sides stretch forth to me the pleasant gifts of sea and land, and them who abide in me, either a bird singing or the sweet cry of the ferryman, lulls to rest. Translation of J. W. Mackale The Young Wife, Julianus Egyptius, 532 A.D. In season the bride chamber held thee, out of season the grave took thee. O Anastasia, flower of the blithe graces, for thee a father, for thee a husband, pours bitter tears, for thee haply even the ferryman of the dead weeps. For not a whole year didst thou accomplish beside thine husband, but at sixteen years old, alas, the tomb holds thee. Translation of J. W. Mackail A nameless grave, Paulus Salentiarius. My name, my country, what are they to thee? What, whether proud or bare, my pedigree? Perhaps I far surpassed all other men. Perhaps I fell below them all. What then? Suffice it, stranger, that thou seest a tomb, thou knowest its use, it hides, no matter whom. Translation of William Cowper Resignation Joannes Barbuculus, 6th century A.D. Gazing upon my husband as my last thread was spun, I praise the gods of death, and I praise the gods of marriage, those that I left my husband alive, and these that he was even such an one, but may he remain a father for our children. Translation of J. W. Mackail The House of the Righteous Macedonius, 6th century A.D. Righteousness has raised this house from the first foundation even to the lofty roof, for Macedonius fashioned not his wealth by heaping up from the possessions of others with plundering sword, nor has any poor man here wept over his vain and profitless toil, being robbed of his most just hire, and as rest from labor is kept inviolate by the just man, so let the works of pious mortals endure. Translation of J. W. Mackail Love's Farriage Agathias, 527-565 A.D. Since she was watched and could not kiss me closely, divine Rodanthe cast her maiden's own from off her waist, and holding it thus loosely, by one end she put a kiss thereon. Then I, love's stream as though a channel taking, my lips upon the other end did press, and drew the kisses in while ceaseless making. Thus from afar replied to her caress. So the sweet girdle did beguile our pain, being a fairy for our kisses twain. Translation of Alma Strettel The following are undetermined in date. Anna Fowler, Isidorus With reeds and bird lime from the desert air, Eumelus gathered free though scanty fare, No lordly patron's hand he deigned to kiss, Nor luxury knew save liberty nor bliss. Thrice thirty years he lived, and to his heirs, his reeds bequeathed, his bird lime, and his snares. Translation of William Cowper Youth and Riches Anonymous I was young but poor, now in old age I am rich, alas, alone of all men pitiable in both, who then could enjoy when I had nothing, and now have when I cannot enjoy. Translation of J. W. Mackail The Singing Reed, Anonymous I, the reed, was a useless plant, for out of me grow not figs, nor apple, nor grape cluster, but man consecrated me a daughter of Helicon, piercing my delicate lips and making me the channel of a narrow stream, and thenceforth, whenever I sip black drink, like one inspired, I speak all words with this voiceless mouth. Translation of J. W. Mackail First love again remembered, anonymous. While yet the grapes were green, thou didst refuse me, 
When they were ripe, didst proudly pass me by. But do not grudge me still a single cluster, now that the grapes are withering and dry. Translation of Alma Strettel Slave and Philosopher, Anonymous I, Epictetus, was a slave while here, deformed in body and like Iris poor, yet to the gods immortal I was dear. Translation of Lilla Cabot Perry by permission of the American Publishers Corporation. Goodbye to Childhood, Anonymous. Her tambourines and pretty ball and the net that confined her hair and her dolls and dolls' dresses, Timorita dedicates before her marriage to Artemis of Lenny, a maiden to a maiden, as is fit, do thou, daughter of Leto, laying thine hand over the girl Timorita, preserve her purely in her purity. Translation of J.W. Mackail Wishing, Anonymous It's oh to be a wild wind when my lady's in the sun. She just unbind her neckerchief and take me breathing in. It's oh to be a red rose, just a faintly blushing one, so she'd pull me with her hand, and to her snowy breast I'd win. Translation of William M. Hardinge Hope and Experience, Anonymous Whoso has married once and seeks a second wedding is a shipwrecked man who sails twice through a difficult gulf. Translation of J.W. Mackail The Service of God, Anonymous Me, Chilidon, priestess of Zeus, who knew well in old age how to make offering on the altars of the immortals, happy in my children, free from grief, the tomb holds. For with no shadow in their eyes, the gods saw my piety. Translation of J.W. Mackail The Pure in Heart, Anonymous He who enters the incense-filled temple must be holy, and holiness is to have a pure mind. Translation of J.W. Mackail the Water of Purity, Anonymous Hallowed in soul, O stranger, come even into the precinct of a pure God, touching thyself with the virgin water. For the good a few drops are set, but a wicked man the whole ocean cannot wash in its waters. Translation of J.W. Mackail Rose and Thorn, Anonymous The rose is at her prime a little while, which once past thou wilt find when thou seekest no rose but a thorn. Translation of J. W. Mackail A Life's Wandering, Anonymous Know ye the flowery fields of the Cappadocian nation? Thence I was born of good parents. Since I left them I have wandered to the sunset and the dawn. My name was Glaphyrus, and like my mind, I lived out my sixtieth year in perfect freedom. I know both the favor of fortune and the bitterness of life. Translation of J.W. Mackail. End of section 37, read by Bryce Cries, Youngstown, USA.